right. Uh, good evening, Michigan City, Indiana. <laughs> uh, what a beautiful day in the beautiful city, and you're looking at a bunch of people, much like those of you in the audience, that believes that the best days are still ahead of us, and we're all pulling the same direction to make that actually happen. Um, we have a modest agenda this evening with only 22 items on it, but we will try to drive through pretty quickly. Uh, if I could let the record show that I believe that all our commissioners are in attendance this evening. And uh, so with that, uh, we'll skip the roll call and go on for the approval of the minutes for the executive session on April 8th regular meeting on April 8th and the executive session on April 30th and special meeting on April 30th. So, um, okay, you're going to have to turn your little mic on there. Thank you. I make a motion that we approve the minutes for the both meetings. Support. Moved and seconded. Any <coughs> for the, for all four or just one? For all four. For all four. Any further discussion? One correction, Mr. Chairman. Um, under the discussion, when we talked about the Washington Park Entry Traffic Circle Project, and as you remember, we talked about the um, landscaping project and uh, how we got around that. But in the minutes, it's reflected. Uh, the word bid is reflected over and over again. If we could just show that approval is of the minutes with the word bid uh, replaced with the word quotes. And, and the only reason why I bring that up is just because there are significant statutory requirements for bids that do not exist for the same thing with quotes, and I don't want anybody misinterpreting that. So, All right, Sam. So I'll let you make sure you get with Deb to make sure that's corrected appropriately. But that would be the only correction. That would just be in that one section as well. All right. <laughs> Any other comments or corrections? All right. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. So, as corrected, Mr. Sirnak, we had a, an executive session before this. Do you have any comments? There was an executive session before this meeting. Uh, no items were discussed uh, that were not permitted by the open door law, and no decisions were made. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's move down to the final uh, approval of the claims for May. Mr. Phillips? All right, you should have a claims docket in front of you dated May 14th, 2019. On that, you'll note standard payroll items for April of 2019. Uh, make back up. Oh, I'm sorry. May 13th or May 14th? May 13th. I'm sorry. All right, thank May 13th. Thanks. Uh, standard payroll items for April of 2019. Uh, claims to the operating fund uh, include uh, payment to Great American Financial for copier fees for April of 2019. And monthly retainer uh, for Alan Sirinek for legal services for April of 2019. Claims to the North TIF fund include payment to Americo Incorporated for uh, costs related to the 709 Franklin uh, demolition project inspection and management. American Structure Point uh, for costs related to uh, the engineering related to the uh, US 12 over Trail Creek project for March of 19. Barnes and Thornburg for legal services to the North TIF through March of 19. Uh, B and DJ Associates for costs related to the Friendship Gardens project. Butler, Fairman and Cipher uh, for costs related to Singing Sands Trail Phase 2 right of way acquisition and Singing Sands Trail Phase 2 engineering through uh, the end of February 19. EC Babilla, I think I'm saying that right, um, for Blue Chip Expansion Project Roofing Costs. Environmental Incorporated for Phase 2 Environmental Site Assessment for property located within the North TIF. Fidelity National Title for title work on properties located within the North TIF District. Garib Construction uh, for Washington Park West Parking Lot Pay Application Number 5 Partial. Uh, partial because we're splitting the costs on that with the uh, Port Authority. Hitchcock Design Group for costs related to preliminary design services for the Civic Plaza project. Hall Signs uh, for signs related to uh, picking up dog waste on the, prop on the, on the uh, Redevelopment Commission properties at 7th and Franklin. Keel Architecture for Engineer's Castle Assessment Pay Application Number 10 Revised. 
uh, Laporte County appraisal for appraisal on a property located within the North Tiff District. PR's lawn care for landscape maintenance of various properties located in the North Tiff District. Roger Brooks International for uh, Civic Plaza uh, design programming and operations. Sanitary District of Michigan City for reimbursement regarding vapor intrusion, intrusion assessment. Uh, SCH of Indiana for costs related to the Washington Park Entry and Traffic Circle project. Alan Cernick for legal services to the North Tiff for April of 2019. Skyline Plastering for Blue Chip Expansion Project, uh, EFIS and Stucco related to that project. Stanhope Consulting for Civic Plaza Public Outreach. Um, the Antero Group for costs related to the Waste Inc. project for March of 2019. Valuation services for appraisals for uh, properties located within the North Tiff District, and Van Winkle Batten for environmental remediation. Environmental mediation. I'm sorry. I believe that's associated with the Trail Creek properties issues. Correct. Okay. Claims to <coughs> claims to the South Tiff include uh, payment to Hassan Associates for construction administration and inspection related to the Ameriplex Drive project. Uh, payment to Michigan City Area Schools for the technology grant. Uh, for the final payment of our agreement. Alan Cyrenek for legal services to the South TIF for April of 2019. Uh, claims to the Ohio Street Construction Fund include pay application number 10 to Reith Riley Construction Company. Uh, American Structure Point for construction inspection for March of 2019. U.S. Bank for administrative fees uh, associated with the Ohio Street Bond. And Baker Tilly Municipal Adv Advisors for arbitrage related to the Ohio Street Bond. There were no claims to the Wabash Street uh, Fund, and there were no claims to the Northeast TIF Fund. All right. Anyone have any comments or questions on the claims? Uh, if hearing none, what's the pleasure of the commission? Mr. Chairman, I do approve. Seconded. Moved and seconded. One item I will point out on here, and we're going to get an update from it here in a few minutes from Kevin, is this is the final pay of our technology grant to the Michigan City Area Schools. And this is for six hundred thousand dollars, and I believe our total commitment fee was three point four million dollars. So it was a million dollars in the first year and four subsequent 000. years at six hundred thousand. So very happy to make that contribution to the schools, and I'm sure we're going to get a great update uh, tonight. So we have a motion to second. Any other comments or questions? All right. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. All right, you want to run down the financial report, Mr. Phillips? Okay, the, you should have a balance sheet dated um, March 31st, 2019. In front of you, on that you'll, you'll note uh, cash items, including the operating account, it currently has a balance of $29,506.37. Um, I need to check on the status of the uh, of the city's um, transfer of the funds that we need for 2019 on that. that okay. should, uh, so we should be receiving the full amount of the balance, of, or sorry, the uh, appropriation uh, for the redevelopment department for operating. I'll check on the status of that. Uh, the Southside TIF account has a balance of $13,485,984.17. The Southside TIF debt reserve account has a balance of $336,308.50. The Southside TIF capital account has a balance of $17,715.28. The North End TIF account has a balance of $4,464,805.25. The Wabash Street Streetscape Construction account has a balance of $122,342.44. The Wabash Street Streetscape Debt Reserve has a balance of $216,072.49. And the Northeast TIF account has a balance of $112,702.52. Uh, bringing our total cash on hand to $18,785,437.02. Loans receivable include a loan to the East Side TIF from the operating account of $21,028.49. And county business loan fund, our, our portion of that loan fund of uh, $133,333, uh, bringing our total loans receivable to 
$361.49, which brings our total assets to $18,939,798.51. So, would you go back over the operating account question? Yeah, so we receive an, alloc we, we receive an appropriation uh, through the city um, for operating the for the for the salaries and supplies and all those things and we have, it doesn't appear that we've received the transfer um, from the oh, city okay. yet and I will look into the status of that. Okay, so that that number will come up. That number will come up. Yeah, right. and those are funds that we can't use TIF dollars for. Correct. So that's why we do require some city approved funds in order to do our job. Correct. So, all right. Any questions on the balance sheet? What's the pleasure of the commission? I make a motion to approve the financial report is read. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. All right. Item number six, liquor license requests. Mr. Cernak, you want to run through this? Uh, Attorney Anthony Novak and his clients are here. This is an uh, alcohol request, three-way alcohol request um, for on behalf of uh, Mucho Moss and Royale with Cheese, both of which are located on Franklin Street in the, uh, um, well, on Franklin Street, in the, uh, and have been there for, and Mucho Moss has been there for two years, and I want to say that uh, Royale with Cheese has been there for over a year. Both have been there. Both are established. Both are year-round operations. Uh, Commissioner Oberly and I have met with uh, the applicants as well as uh, Attorney Novak and um, as far as I would go anyway and, and Commissioner Oberly might go for, can go further but certainly their application uh, now meets the, uh, uh, the requirement that this commission has established for the past several years. So Anthony, you want to give us a little overview? Yeah, if you don't mind, I please, please, we'd love to a little bit of presentation for both applications, please. Sure, uh, and I'm here with Frank Marufo, and he's certainly able to answer questions uh, as well. So, my name is Anthony Novak. I'm an attorney with Newby Lewis, Kaminsky, and Jones in the Port. I'm here on behalf of both of the restaurants tonight, both Mucho Mas and Royale with Cheese, uh, both seeking a three-way riverfront license. Um, while both of these restaurants are and will be operated as separate and distinct entities. Because they say, share the same uh, familial ownership, being Frank and Jose Marufo, both of which have collectively over 25 years in the restaurant business, uh, we will be presenting uh, both together tonight. As Mr. Sarnik indicated, we did submit an application previously which had information about both of the restaurants, including financials, menus, floor plans, and other narratives about the business. So a little bit of background about these two restaurants. Um, both local restaurants are open running, um, and both are members of the Michigan City Main Street Association. Let's talk a little bit about Mucho Mas. That's located in the heart of the Uptown Arts District at 727 Franklin Street. Um, Frank describes its menu as a blend of traditional Mexican food with West Coast flavors and an emphasis on fresh and organic veggies and scratch-made recipes. So while this location itself was open in 2015, the original and only other location was open in Laporte in 2009, which location seen great success and has seen continued growth ever since it was open. When the Michigan City location opened in 2015, the Marufos invested approximately $40,000 into the building, um, and ultimately Mucho Mas employs 10 people, three of which live in the UAD. As for Royale, it's a little bit newer. It's also located in the UAD at 827 Franklin Street, so just a block to the south. Frank describes that menu as New American with a very eclectic menu with an emphasis on quality craft hamburgers. Uh, they opened in 2017 and last year saw month over month growth. Uh, the Marufos invested approximately $15,000 in that location. They employed 10 people, six of which are Michigan City residents, the remaining four are LaPorte County residents. Although Royale's location is closer to both First Presbyterian Church and then St. Paul Church and School, uh, I submitted with the application letters of uh, support or recommendation, excuse me, letters of support that Frank ultimately got from both of those, uh, both of those organizations. As you all know, the Riverfront License Program is an economic development tool. 
It plays an important part in fostering the development of the downtown of Michigan City. Its purpose is to grow and make attractive the downtown area, both by attracting more people to our community, as well as incentivizing business owners to invest in the downtown. Some of the restaurants that have currently received these licenses include Fiddlehead, Cool Running, Zorn, Polis Peasant, Chickpea. With those examples and with the overall intent of the program, it is clear that the program is not designed simply to give somebody a license to serve alcohol, but instead create a unique type of business that can have offerings to incentivize and bring people to the downtown. That goal is to assist the establishment in being unique, distinct, and a much visit. In my opinion, and certainly in Frank's opinion, we believe Mucho Mas and Royale fit that goal. Both of them have an established reputation of providing quality food, service, and what we believe is most important, a commitment to and involvement with the downtown area. Both have had success building a family-oriented environment and have no intent to change that and become focused on serving alcohol. And finally, both of the owners, being the Marufos, uh, have invested in and shown a commitment to buildings downtown. While both have found success without alcohol, it is believed that this license would transform them from being just another Mexican joint, just another burger joint, to a casual hangout that focuses not only on its focuses not only on its unique food offerings, but also on its craft cocktails and brews. Currently, if a customer wanted to go out on a weekend and have dinner, their, their night kind of looks like this. Drive downtown, eat for an hour or less, leave downtown. That's less than an hour downtown with virtually no foot traffic whatsoever. <coughs> Frank's goals in having these licenses is directly in line with the goal of the program. That is to no longer have the restaurant and the meal be the destination, but have it be the first or last stop of many being downtown. One of those nights could include having a cocktail at Royale, then shopping in a local business, looking at an art gallery, and then maybe finishing your night, hopefully at Mucho Mas, for some dinner, a cocktail, and a nice nightcap. With Mucho Mas, Frank uh, envisions it to be a tequila-centric offering, and with uh, Royale, he envisions it being a whiskey-centric offering. Both restaurants desire to use the permit to create nighttime events that would ultimately draw people downtown, things such as live music, movie nights, guest shop, guest chef pop-ups, and the like. Things that ultimately draw people to come and stay rather than to come and go. Upon opening the downtown plaza, both plan to adjust their um, scheduling, both in their hours of operation around those events, so that they can hopefully draw more people in attendance to those downtown plaza events. Both restaurants would continue to work alongside the Main Street Association whom they already have a great working relationship in order and, and would want to cross promote any future events they would have. So ultimately it is believed that by having these licenses, uh, Mucho Mas and Royale would be a driving force in bringing people downtown in those evening hours, adding to that nighttime traffic uh, that is often lacking. And that by giving consumers more options for food and recreation along the street, Mucho Mas and Royale believes these permits would make them a unique offering and draw those types of crowds. So we're certainly available for any questions, as is Frank. Um, that's it for now. All right. Uh, any questions from the commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Oberly, you were on the task force to committee to review this. Do you have any comments? Difficult to, to add to what uh, Attorney Novak has already indicated. He's done a very comprehensive presentation here this evening. I think what is important here is we're talking about two small, successful operations that are looking to expand the niche that helps broaden the appeal of the uptown area. That by expanding the hours, uh, attracting people back into the to the evening, that it gives us a v additional viability in terms of filling other spaces downtown uh, as, as we go forward with our developmental projects on Franklin Street itself. Uh, Again, as he's indicated, uh, they, they're looking at the plans for the plaza to do some coordination with, with their scheduling. Uh, they're already in good grace with Main Street, working together in terms of the promotion of the area itself. Uh, again, I, I would think that this is an ideal setup for us, that there's smaller businesses that are having an opportunity to expand their menu, if you will, based on the unique act aspect of these licenses themselves.
I'd like to motion to table this till next month. Motion to table. Is there a second? Motion to table. Uh, is, which um, would specifically, which meeting are we talking about? The next next month. Or yeah. yeah, we have announced this to the public, but we're planning a special meeting on May twenty first. So next Tuesday. So just to be clear, Mr. Kowalski, are you recommending tabling to next month's regular meeting? Uh, yes. Or the special meeting on the 21st? The next month's regular meeting. Okay. That would be June 10th. Is that in line with the original table motion, John? Yes. Okay, we have a motion to table <coughs> to June 10th. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. I, just in fairness to some of those in the audience, not all of our commissioners have had a chance to review the entire application. So I think it is important that everyone gets a chance to review the materials with sufficient time to do their own analysis and make a recommendation uh, for that. Uh, it is an exciting opportunity for us, and, and I, I think uh, it's good for the city. However, I do think it's important that we appropriately give everyone a chance on the commission to review the materials. So, And if you guys could just let me know if there's any additional information that you would ultimately need, I'm sure that we'll both be glad to um, supply. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for your investment in Michigan City. It's much appreciated. So. All right. Uh, let's go to... Let's see, is it Jerry McGuire's brother, Kevin McGuire? <laughs> we have the technology grant report. Show me the money. Good evening, commissioners and community. Um, as we have come accustomed to now, uh, for the last uh, couple of Mays, we uh, given you a follow-up report on uh, what has happened this school year. Um, you have two documents that I laid in front of you. One is the uh, planned expenditures for next year. The other is the update of uh, what happened last school year. So when you get a chance, please uh, go through those. If you have any questions regarding those, feel free to email me or contact me, whatever is most comfortable, and I can follow up with you with those. The first thing I just want to point out on the uh, spreadsheet um, in front of you, just to, if you compare those to years past, it's going to be very similar. The big difference is the hardware budget we have increased this year, um, and the primarily primary role of that budget is going to be expanding our PLTW capabilities in the, at the high school primarily, um, as well as uh, our digital arts class. So again, focusing on those college and career readiness courses and uh, make sure our students are uh, well prepared. We have needs uh, specifically in the computer science uh, areas um, to add some newer and more updated uh, CPUs in those classrooms. So dollars will be going directly towards those. And then, as always, uh, for Compared to years past, uh, roughly 75% of the budget is going to staff development, making sure that our teachers are prepared to use the technology in the classroom and can continue that project uh, with the instruction. Because ultimately, the devices are great, but unless the instruction changes and uh, teacher knowledge is increase, uh, the device doesn't have a whole lot of meaning and a whole lot of help in the classroom. So really, I wanted to keep tonight, my part anyway, is very short. I asked uh, Amy Heyman. She's the curriculum director at Barker Middle School. Um, as you're aware, this is the end of our, our five-year plan that we laid out there. Um, really, as we told you from the beginning, as I stood in front of you and committed to you that uh, our goal was to get devices in the hands of students. Last year was the first year that we had a device in the hands of every child. Um, they were take-home devices, grades 7 through 12, and they were in the classroom devices um, at the elementary level. So this year, this fall, we will be take home four through twelve, with K through three being uh, take home if needed by the teacher. So there's a little bit more control there um, as we kind of transition the the early grades to that. So I asked Amy to present an, one question that I asked her was, which was, uh, how did Chromebooks or how do Chromebooks change the environment at Parker Middle School? So if I may, I'll invite Amy up to kind of share with you how things have changed. Thank you, Kevin. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Amy Hammond. Um, I've been at Barker Middle School for 25 years now. I am our curriculum coach, and I'm also our STEM coordinator, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, Kevin asked me to speak a few minutes um, on behalf of that question. How did Chromebooks, how have they changed 
our learning environment at Barker. So I'm here to tell you that students and teachers alike, we cannot even imagine the years that we've gone without students having the one-to-one -one Chromebooks. It has been so amazing this year. Students really have had the world opened up to them at home, at school, anywhere they can take their device and access the internet. But really what's more exciting and more amazing is that in all content areas, whether it's science, social studies, wellness class, band, chorus, whatever content area it may be, students are able and teachers are able to, to give students a huge variety of experiences with their content, such as research, exploration, discovery, many, many projects, presentations, virtual labs, virtual field trips, educational games, students creating websites, and it goes on and on. This is so exciting to get the kids totally engaged and involved in their education. And we have 13 and 14 year olds at Barker, so you know those young adolescents, we gotta catch them and we gotta get them excited about being at Barker. And the Chromebooks have done just that. Also, it addresses many different learning styles with our students, and our student engagement has gone way up. Students have a choice in learning. They also have some differentiation available to them by using the Chromebooks, which is perfect because every student, their levels and their abilities are at different levels. And if we can hit all those students and get them excited and take them where they need to go, that's great. Also, it allows for the students that are reluctant to ask questions in class or are too cool or too shy, they're able to use their email or Google Classroom or Blackboard to ask their teachers questions in case, you know, they really don't want to during the school day, which we see that. Or like I said, in the middle school, they're too cool. But we feel that we have empowered our students to become motivated, independent learners and problem solvers. They are using those Chromebooks as a tool for 21st century skills of creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, and communication. And at Barker, we're an Indiana Department of Education certified STEM middle school in Indiana. And this has really helped with our focus on technology, getting students excited, and showing that our community has supported our efforts and are still supporting our efforts. It also mirrors our everyday life in the workforce. I use my computer, my laptop, all day long to email, to make presentations, to use Google Docs, slides, uh, folders, multimedia opportunities, and our students are doing the same thing. So they are mirroring what they'll be doing in the future. E-learning days. Our Chromebooks have been vital to those e-learning days. And as you know, this year, we had a brutal January and February. If it wasn't for e-learning, we would have lost eight content days a week and a half before our state testing window. As you know, we have high stakes testing going on right now in all our schools called iLearn. Our students would have missed eight days of content if it wasn't for having the e-learning and the students having those Chromebooks. That is huge for us and for our students. It also kept that clear focus throughout those eight days and a consistency with content and it continued building those independent learners with students. And students were able to communicate with their teachers and collaborate for guidance through those e-learning days. But bottom line, the Chromebooks help to prepare our students to become productive community members later on, whether it's high school, college, trade school, and in the workforce later. So thank you so much. The Chromebooks have made a huge difference with our students. So we thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, it's exciting to me just to see your excitement and thrill with something <laughs> we were able to help with. So does anybody have any questions for Amy or Kevin? Uh, just a comment. Easy. <laughs> you, know, you know, Amy, you know, I think about we talk about the schools all the time. Yes, we do. And I'm very proud. I wasn't on the commission at the time, but they were able to do this because... I'm a firm believer that if we can't get the schools going the way they want them to go, 
everything that we're trying to do up here is not going to work anyway. Absolutely. So I'm really proud that I'm really happy it's working out for you. Thank you. It, it has been so exciting. That's great. Other comments from commissioners? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, go ahead. Uh, just uh, to have that much energy after 25 years of the middle schools, <laughs> I tell you what, that's that's worth something right there. But uh, uh, as far as the the e learning, and I admitted 25 years, <laughs> uh, the e learning days and uh, uh, access to the internet. Have we had any issues with students that uh, don't have access to the internet in their home? Uh, uh, and, and how would we deal with that if we do? I mean. It was something I thought about. I can, and then you can, um, just directly at Barker, um, we don't have too many students that have those issues. Our Barker is open on those days, so if students need to get to a, a spot where Wi-Fi is available for them, it is available. Um, students are allowed, um, I think it's three days after the e-learning day, so if internet was an issue, which at my house internet sometimes is an issue with my direct TV, I shouldn't say that loud, but sometimes I don't have internet access also, or TV on those heavy snow days, so we address those those items that way, but students seem to be um, able to get that Wi-Fi access, so. The challenge has been is what they consider to be broadband access, and what we consider to be broadband access, and what we're learning is the cell phone is becoming a great tool for our students, so um, it's been a professional development, actually, process for us to train the teachers that not everything's happening on the Chromebook. Students do have access to it, but they don't always have Internet access where their cell phone, the smartphone, is always connected. So it's really how the content is being presented to them and the tools that the, the teachers are using. But to, it, there is an issue. It is one that we're trying to address. I think uh, our conversations may in further, you know, this would develop some opportunities for us and for the city to try and um, bridge that gap a little bit better. Thank you. So you said Sparker, or did you say Barker? Is there Barker. Barker, okay. Barker, so but we sparkle, if you, if you will. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm if you want to get it confused. So uh, it's a hot spot that they can get to without being in the classroom. Is that right? All of our buildings are, yes. Correct. Okay. So, And so what's the accountability for the teacher to get back to the student? So they get an email at 11 o'clock at night. Do they, how do you work through that stuff? Yeah, so our teachers are required to have, if it's an e-learning day, our teachers are required to have their um, assignment, their instruction, whatever it may be, by 9 o'clock the following morning. And okay. principals are keep them accountable to that. Okay, so they have to respond by not, no later than 9 the next morning, right? Or, Correct. The assignment has to be posted, and then they have to, part of the teacher's responsibility is throughout the day to make sure that they're communicating with parents or with students that have issues. Yeah, yeah, so their, their work day becomes uh, E-Day as well, just working on the computer. Exactly. And I can tell you, many of them have come back to us, and they don't like e-learning days just as much as some of our parents don't like them, because it, it changes the work day quite a bit, and not being in front of a student, certainly myself included, certainly changes how you support those individuals, so it, it's a bit of a change, it's, and it, in many cases, it's more work. So, other questions or comments? Uh, just, so, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I just had a comment. I just wanted to state that um, Kevin, you, the staff, all of the staff at all of the schools, the administration, have really done a tremendous job, and I don't know how you did it with that e-learning in January, but I know that was an extremely hard task for not just the students, but the parents, too. But all the issues got resolved, and I don't see any problems with it. And again, um, you guys did great um, with development. We thank you, and continue the workload. Absolutely. I'd just like to follow up with that a little bit. We said five years ago that when we could have an e-learning day, we knew that we'd be successful. I can't say that we were 100% successful, because there were issues this first go-around, but the fact that we could offer the e-learning days and our students were prepared for it. Teachers were ready to go. I think it states a lot for the success that, that we had this year. I also want to just uh, mention for the community members, the support and the maintenance of the Chromebooks are being done is being done by students at the high school. So that's a course that we offer. So the repair of screens or anything, that's being done by students. Um, and the financial sustainability now, um, again, in the report I mentioned, is all transitioned over to textbook rental. So as, as we carry this program forward now, None of the redevelopment dollars are going into Chromebooks or devices that are offered to students. Now all that has transitioned to the textbook rental side. So we'll be moving forward with uh, phase two of whatever that may be now, moving forward. So, so related to phase two, do you anticipate a request of the commission for future funds? 
Yes. I mean, right, exactly. <laughs> I just I assumed that wasn't going to be the answer. And I, I don't want to cut short shrift the city council for their contribution either. Absolutely. That was to, a big so, first step. Right. And so I would anticipate that, just given the feedback I'm getting here, that assuming that you approach both the city council and the redoing commission, that we'd be receptive to an, a future request. So. And we appreciate that. We are at the very beginning stages of our planning process. Um, we are finishing up our next year staff development uh, process for the, the teachers are two hours uh, a month after after school. So once we get all that laid out, we'll certainly be back in the fall to continue the conversations to see how the next round, um, where our, our focus is going to be. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Exciting times ahead. So. Thank you. Have a great evening. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, let's see. Number eight, cash flow analysis. <coughs> Any Moser with... Baker Tilly and and Baker Tilly and Randy Rampola. I don't know what that is, but uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. Randy isn't able to join us this evening sure. um, due to another commitment that's overlapping. Um, but Andy Mauser from Baker Tilly, former formerly Unba, um, or combined with Unba, uh, is here to give us a, our annual bonding capacity and cash flow analysis. So I turn it over to him. Thank you and good evening. Um, I'm just going to kind of quickly go through the bonding capacity and cash flow analysis. Um, we've put this report together for the Redevelopment Commission um, at least once or twice over the last um, several years. Um, and it's really just a report, um, an analysis to look at your um, capacity for um, short-term projects in the future as well as um, larger scale, longer-term projects in the future as well. So um, I'll go through the report and we've got a section for your, your north side, downtown area, your south side area. Um, and then also your northeast area. Um, and we have been in contact with the auditor's office on the east side TIF as well um, to ensure that that will begin capturing TIF in 2020. So hopefully next year at this time we'll be um, adding the east side TIF area to this analysis as well. Um, so I'll kind of start on page three, um, which takes a look at your downtown north side um, annual TIF collections. Um, in 2018, um, based on um, 2018 assessed values and tax rates, we estimated that the Redevelopment Commission would capture just over $4 million um, in tax increment. Um, and your actual collections for 18 were actually a little bit over 100%, um, likely due to some collections of previous year delinquencies in there. Um, so you actually captured a little bit over $4.1 million. Um, for 2019, um, your assessed values continued to grow. Um, and for 2019, you should capture a little over $4.3 million um, going forward. And that, um, assuming no growth, um, you'll remain at that level um, through 2027. In 2027, the um, expansion portion of the north side area does expire. Um, so that area will be returned back to the tax base at that point, no longer captured as TIF. Um, so from that point forward, um, all the way through 2039, you will capture um, just the original portion um, of the north side area. Um, and so once that expansion um, does go away, your, your collections would be right around $1.6 million. On the next page, page four, we've taken a look at um, a couple of the larger scale projects that the Redevelopment Commission I know is considering, um, one being the Central Plaza project, um, also looking at the Joel Station Block project in conjunction with the South Shore project. Um, so you can see um, $6 million and $5 million projects respectively. Um, we've included the funding of a debt service reserve fund, um, which is money that's set aside, um, which you've typically done with um, TIF financing, it's money that's set aside through the life of the bonds to provide extra security on the bonds. Um, and then the various um, other financing costs, including capitalized interest during construction. Um, so you can see for the six and five million dollar projects, you'd be looking at total financings a little over seven and six million dollars. Um, and then on the potential station block project, just a small contribution um, from your cash on hand that would be used to fund a portion of that, that, that service reserve. So page five takes a look at um, potential payback for the plaza project, um, assuming those bonds would be issued this year, um, about a 20-year repayment on the bonds. Um, you can see estimated interest rates, and these are estimates based on the current market with some um, cushion in there for timing. Um, if you were to issue today, I think the rates would likely be a little bit lower, um, but this provides some cushion, um, and you can see rates ranging from about 1.8 to 4%. So a net interest cost right around 3.5% for a 20-year financing. 
Um, and then on the far right column, you can see your um, annual repayment um, from the illustrated financing. So um, in the first year, no payment due to interest being capitalized during construction. Um, payments would be right around six six hundred and fifty thousand dollars, um, with decrease in the middle years, and then um, increase to about five hundred and fifty in the later years. And I'll kind of walk th through the structure of that here in a couple um, schedules. Um, it's meant to, um, as I talked about, the expansion of your areas when your TIF will decrease um, as a portion of the area goes away, and then just the payoff of your existing debt. Um, structuring this around to make sure you maintain level coverage. Um, and then again, that debt service reserve money that could be used um, to um, make the final payments on the bonds. So um, that amount that would be set aside would then be used to pay the bonds off, in this case, about a year, year and a half early. Um, page six takes a look um, at the potential um, station block financing. Um, we've assumed that these would be issued next year, um, but certainly timing um, to be determined, and, and we can certainly adjust um, in the future. But um, we've assumed additional cushion for these interest rates with the financing being further out on the horizon. Um, so you can see the net interest cost on this financing would be maybe a little bit closer to 4% on a 20-year financing um, with a similar um, structure, two years of capitalized interest during construction, um, and then payments in the early years around 800000 and then 300000 through the life of the bonds. And again, the reserve fund on this one, um, because these bonds would be paid off um, a little bit quicker on the front end, that reserve could be used to actually pay these off about three years early as well. So then I think page seven really kind of pulls all of that together, um, takes a look at your estimated tax increment. Again, the $4.3 million this year going out through 2027, and then the $1.6 million once the portion of the area expires. Um, and then your various debt obligations that are already outstanding. Um, the 2010 Lafayette Barker bonds, the 2011 Elston Grove bonds, the 2015 Wabash Street bonds, and then the two illustrative financings um, that we just went through. So um, in 2019, of the $4.3 million, um, you currently spend about $1.5 million on debt service. Um, as we go forward, um, assuming those additional financings, um, we would look to still maintain the 150% coverage um, for your overall debt service. So it would still leave you um, about $1.4 million um, for additional projects on an annual basis. And then once the portion of the area expires, um, still over half a million in those later years. And then on the next page, page eight, um, we've just looked at um, this on a more cash flow basis. So looking at your current balance, um, on an annual basis, looking at your tax increment that's collected and then your annual debt service payments. And then um, in working with Craig, um, identifying different projects that are committed for 2019 um, and then also um, out on the, on the further horizon as well. So looking at different engineering costs, construction costs, capital expenditures, um, miscellaneous costs, um, and then just taking a look at how those projects fit in. Um, we've also included some larger um, projects for illustrative purposes, um, park improvements, things like that, um, just to kind of give you an idea of projects of those certain size, um, kind of where they would fit in the cash flow um, side of things. Um, I think it's also important to note that um, on an annual basis, this includes, um, or at least it shows your TIF being collected um, at one point in the year, um, and then your debt service payments made um, right alongside that. And it's, I guess, important to note that your TIF comes in semi-annually in June and December, and then is used to make your bond payments um, for the following, um, typically July, August, or January, February. So, um, you know, as you look for projects here in the future, I think it'll be important to um, take a look as that TIF comes in semi-annually, how that would impact the cash flow as well. But I think this at least gives you an idea of what type of projects could be funded um, on the near horizon. So then we've done the, um, essentially the same thing for your south side TIF area. Um, in 2018, um, estimated to capture just under $3 million, and your actual collection is right around 2.9. So um, that one just short of 100%, but still very close to um, the estimate for 18. Um, and then in 19, um, just like your north side area, should increase as well to um, nearly $3.1 million. Um, the south side area works much the same, same way as your north side area. There is a portion that expires. It's actually the... Um, original portion of the area for this one that will expire in 2027 and then the expansion 
um, continues out through 2038. So um, once the original portion does expire and ret return to the um, overlapping tax base, um, your TIF collections will be a little under 400,000. And then on page 10, um, we've just looked at one illustrative financing for the South Side area, um, and that being the South Shore Double Track Project. Um, the Redevelopment Commission's total commitment um, of about $12.2 million. Um, we've shown financed about $3.5 million through a long-term financing, um, and then about $9.5 million paid from cash on hand. And I'll kind of show how that fits into the cash flow as well, but then very similar structure. You'd have a debt service reserve um, and the amount of almost $600,000, and then your various financing costs, including um, interest during construction. Um, so if you take a look at page 11, this looks at um, illustrative repayment structure. Um, again, right around a 20-year financing. And you'll notice because um, that portion of your TIF does fall off in the early years, we've front-loaded um, this repayment. So you can see the majority of the $3.5 is actually paid back in about the first 10 years. Um, and then that $600,000 debt service reserve would be available um, in 2028 um, to pay off the remainder of the bond. So this 20-year financing could actually be paid off in about 10 years um, due to that reserve money that would be set aside up front. So um, then page 12, again, just um, pulls the full comparison together for the South Side area. Your $3.1 million currently, the $400,000 um, beginning in 2028. And that's just compared to your 2011 bonds, um, which refunded the 1999 bonds that were issued for the town center project, the 2015 bonds that refunded the 2007 bonds that were issued for the County Road 400 North project, um, the 2018 bonds that were issued last year for um, the Ohio Street project out by the new hospital, and then the new illustrative bonds for the double track financing. Um, and again, we've tried to maintain that 150% coverage going forward as well. Um, and then page 13, again, takes a look at your um, south side cash flow, um, current balance. Um, we've identified different um, engineering, inspection, capital, miscellaneous costs. Um, also identified the portion of the double track that would be funded from your cash on hand um, and the corresponding reduction to your balance there. And then the portion that would be funded from bond proceeds. Um, and then again, like your north side area, we've identified... Um, additional larger long-term projects um, in the later years as well. And then um, finally, we've done this for your Northeast area as well, um, the GAF project. Um, in 2018, collections for that area were estimated right at 268,000 and your actual collections were um, pretty much exactly <laughs> right on. Two dollars. Two dollars. <laughs> um, and that's based on their real property, so their land and their buildings, and then also their personal property, which is their um, equipment at the site as well, which is captured as TIF. Um, 2019 numbers should be very similar, um, increase um, just slightly. And then that area was set up in 1999, so it would have a 30 year life. So um, you would still be able to collect that TIF all the way through 2030. And then page 15 takes a look at the comparison for your Northeast area. So currently, um, the 1999 GAF bonds. Um, the Redevelopment Commission is only obligated to pay 90% of what you collect, and then the company um, pays the remaining portion of those bonds. Um, so the 273000 that you'll collect this year, you'll pay about 245000 towards the bonds. Um, the company will make the remaining $250,000 payment, and then you'll have about $27,000 remaining. Um, once those bonds are paid off here next year, um, you'll have that full 100% okay. TIF to work with. And then on page 16, we've identified um, just a few projects um, to be paid from the Northeast area, um, including the Carwick Nature, Cheney Run um, projects, um, which can all be paid out of your current balance. So um, behind that is just all your existing debt schedules. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on those. There is just one I wanted to highlight, and I also had passed around um, some bond schedules that I just wanted to hit on just briefly, um, and actually the first Outstanding bond issue on page 17 is your 2010 Lafayette Barker bonds, um, paint from your north side area um, as we went through that portion of the report. Um, those were issued in 2010 and then the remaining interest rates from 2019 all the way through 2033 
um, range from 3.9 to 5%. Um, we do think that there could be some potential savings from refunding those. Um, we've done a number of refundings with the Redevelopment Commission in the past, um, and that's actually one we had looked at back in 2017. Um, in 2017, there was right around $30,000 a year of savings. Um, those bonds are not callable until this coming February, and with the tax, uh, tax Cuts and Jobs Act in 2017, it eliminated the ability to refund um, more than 90 days before that call date. Um, so when we get to the end of this year, you'll then be within that 90-day window to be able to refund these. And based on current interest rates, um, kind of based on where we think the market is currently, and then actually um, we've received a couple proposals from um, different underwriting firms as well. And it looks like savings on an annual basis could be right around $50,000 a year. So that would certainly um, improve the, the cash flow numbers and um, the comparison schedules that we went through as well. So something's still on the horizon, but if um, that's something the Redevelopment Commission would be interested in pursuing, um, could certainly look at um, approvals in the coming months and then um, trying to price bonds uh, later this year to close um, prior to the end of the year. So. All right. Uh Questions or comments? I, yeah, I sure. Have a so I noticed that. Oops. So I noticed that on page. I think it's page ten. This is where we start talking about the. Oh, wait, I'm looking for the double track. Um, where you lay out the page, double track. Page the cash flow is on the one. Here it is, yeah, page 10. Mm -hmm. I noticed that the numbers that were approved by the City Council and Redevelopment Commission are different than what you have here um, in terms of the bond amount versus the cash amount, and I wondered if there was a reason for that. I think it just has to go through, um, or is due to timing. Um, so when we had looked at this previously in the last couple of years, um, as this project's gotten slightly delayed, mm -hmm. Um, since we're essentially paying back the bonds in a shorter period of time, we've tried to reduce the bond size um, to maintain that 150% coverage. So this is really just um, in order to structure the bonds so you would still maintain that 150% coverage. Um, there's no formal requirement for that. So if you okay. did want to bond more and pay less out of cash on hand, you could certainly do that. Okay, um, I think, yeah, because I think our goal was to try to keep the numbers as close as we had sure. before. Um, because of the authority we've been given by the city council, I know we don't want to change, you know, we don't want to change, we don't want to increase it, but we want to definitely capitalize on what was approved. And I think it was a, if I'm not mistaken, it was a $5.5 million bond and a $6.5 million cash contribution, if I'm not mistaken. Something around there, as I recall, um, that got us to that total 12. Um, I just noticed that was a big difference. Um, so that $3.4 million as opposed to the 5.5. Um, and then six as opposed to nine point five, so it was a big it was a big difference, and I just wanted to ask about that. So um, when it, well, we definitely need to clarify. So when it comes time to actually um, go through that process, that we'll want to look at those options and discuss what you know what the coverages are. But I was just taken. I, I, I was just kind of surprised by those numbers because they're so much different than what we had originally what we had originally discussed. So I just wanted to ask about that. And like I said, at your the majority of your Southside TIF um, mm -hmm. is in 2027. So the further we get to 2027, the fewer years you have to pay off to pay those bonds. Right. So, off. so right. that's a good question to split, Craig. My, my if I'm reading page 10 correct, is the Redevelopment Commission's commitment 12.2 million total? <coughs> total. Or, yeah. So that is 12.2. Okay. And they, and then it's how you get to the twelve point two, whether some portion bonds, some portion cash, right? Correct. Okay. And right. we'd be glad to take take a look at additional scenarios. That, the other thing I want to point out, just for the, <coughs> the audience, is the Rita Loan Commission, you know, with the support of the mayor, is putting two thirds of the project money in for the double track project. The county's committing one third. We're committing two thirds from the city. Of course, the, you know, we anticipate some significant development around the station block because of that. So. So I just want to make sure everybody knows we're given at least our share plus. So okay, so I, um, yeah, so I just wanted to ask about that. All right, then um, I noticed for other commission members, I had to spend a little time on this. If you walk down the payments as you go, even if you look on page five, 
here, you'll see the principal balance, how much we owed, and then how much we paid off the principal, and then how much we pay in interest. And you'll see that up down there in 2028, you get a big swing in the numbers. And that's, I'm assuming that's because of the retirement of one of the bonds, right? So it's a Barker Lafayette bond completed in 2028? Correct. A, a portion of that, um, so I guess the 2028 swing is as um, the original portion of the area goes away. Um, oh, okay. Tip drops, but then maybe it's 2033 then. Those additional swings, I think, yeah, 2033 um, is the 2010 Lafayette Barker bonds will be paid off in that year. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. It's it's essentially just it's structured just, around your tips. I, I think for a novice looking at this is you know that's why we hire people like yourself to almost <laughs> tailor the bonds right. and how much money's going to <clears throat> interest and to principal every year. Mm -hmm. So and that swings back and forth depending on what's available. And we've so. tried to keep the bonds paid off in the early years as much as possible. That right. helps keep your borrowing costs down. Um, but certainly want to balance yeah. that with your your need to have additional funds. Yeah. The other thing I noticed, I, I like the idea that, and I'm. We expect this to prove out is that the incremental assessed value or is moving upward. Mm -hmm. and that's exactly what we're trying to do here. The other thing is is on the northeast tiff, and you know we've that was a case where GAF more or less bought the bond, so they were covered in their own bond with that. But we have been challenged at different points in times whether we had any money available in that tiff to actually spend uh, on anything. And, Looks like I see in our plan we have some room to, to help out with um, the Carwick uh, Cheney Run project, at least in the budget, 100000 for that. So mm -hmm. uh, that tax increment uh, was a good investment by the city in the first place to help with the bond, as well as we have a tax increment coming in that now is actually going to be able to put into play for the rest of the uh, north end. It's kind of what my little summary is. <laughs> Also, the other questions or not? It's definitely complex, so and that's why we need good advice. All right, hearing none. Uh, thank you very much. Just, thank you. Go ahead. Greg. So, just real quick, since we have Andy in front of us, I just wanted to let the let the commission members know. I think it's June tenth. I think was our plan to we'll be sending out invitations to the overlapping taxing units um, oh. with regard to um, a meeting that we need to have with them to explain. Basically, the same information to a certain extent um, to basically prove that it's our plan to uh, utilize the the tax and refinancing, tax and refinancing revenue, and we have to kind of itemize how we plan to use that and show that to them. So the work that's been put, you know, that was done to put together this report largely will cover the requirements of what we need to present that day. Um, but we'll just want to give the All right. Well, plus we have, we have more that. requests out there than we have cash, even though it looks right. Like we've right. Money. Um, but just so, to give you know, give you a heads up that as part of our, I believe it's our June tenth meeting, right. we're planning on having that um, presentation to those overlapping taxing units. So, with the help of um, our friends from Baker Tilly, and uh, I believe Randy Rampola will also be on hand for that in case there are any questions from the taxing units um, that we can't as as readily answer, perhaps. So, it's just well, a, do we have to officially accept this no. or anything? Okay. No. Thank so you. We're good to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So number nine, Ohio Street. Did I change the <coughs> deal? So let me preface this. Um, so we have uh, Richie Deal, who's our um, project manager representative on site. Uh, I'm going to have him kind of summarize the timeline, uh, what the request that's before us. But essentially, basically, there, uh, because I've been asked some questions about this, essentially there was some work that was done on the project that didn't fall within the tolerances of the requirements, um, you know, for construction on the project. And there were about 14 to 16 of those where basically the risers and manhole covers uh, were not within the spec of what was spec for the project. And the way to the way to correct that was to install concrete rings um, around those around those risers, if I understand correctly. And then um, essentially, what we're left with is a situation where those don't match throughout the project. Um, and so, for for the purpose of uniformity, as I understood it, for the purpose of uniformity of the project and the you know the same look and feel of the roadway, basically throughout the entire project, the request that's before you for the the fifty four thousand. 
$132 was basically so so that those um, rings that were, in, were the rings are installed so that there's a uniform um, appearance to the uh, to the project, but also I think so that the roadway uh, as it as it interacts with the um, the riser and manhole cover at each of those locations um, wears you know equally and evenly in each of those locations as well. Maybe you can explain this better, Richie. I think you're basically that's a summary. Basically, basically right on. There were uh, 12, <coughs> twelve to fourteen castings that were low that I had Reith Riley. Oh, twelve to fourteen. Sorry. I said 14 to 16. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's relative. But there was 12 to 14 that were low that I had Reith Riley fix on their dime. Uh, once that was complete, I had a request to do the rest of the structures on the project. I believe that was okayed, and I went ahead with it. Um, I believe a, a lot of what people feel when they're driving on that road is there is there are a lot of castings and manholes in that road. We're talking 65 manholes within about a mile of road. I think 43 of them are in the southbound lane. That is a lot of handwork to get around those manholes when they're paving, when they're actually installing the asphalt. Anytime you stop that paver, lift up, get out there with a rake or a shovel and start doing handwork, you're going to feel a little bit of, you know, play in that road. It's not going to be perfectly uniform like an airport runway would be where there's nothing in the way. I think that's, you know, we, we did what we could with adjusting those structures. They sh I'm confident that, you know, the subgrade's fine. There shouldn't be any problems with the density of the backfill or anything underneath the roadway. And uh, it's just, there are <laughs> a lot of, of castings on that road. Anytime you drive over one, you're going to feel it, whether they were perfectly flat to grade or not, you're, you're, you're going to notice it. It's just where they're placed. They're right in the wheel lane. So it, so essentially it's my understanding that the, the uniformity of the, the way that we handle the castings is important because we want the road to wear as evenly as possible you know, throughout the project. So a question was posed to me, how come, how come that wasn't paid for by Reith and Riley? Uh, Reith Riley, and the reason is because it those 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 risers, the way that those those risers and, and manhole covers were placed was within the tolerance of the project specs. Absolutely. It's That's just the it was a uniformity uh, decision. It was a call that was made by a combination of sanitary district and myself um, and it was something that had to happen very quickly. Basically it was a that day um, decision that had to be made and ratified at this meeting um, so that like I said the wear the wear is uniform throughout the project as opposed to different where the castings had to be ringed um, due to the um, uh, due to the construction being out of tolerance versus where they weren't, and so that's that's the quick answer I think to why there's why the request tonight. And um, so, so the question that's come up, and I think you <coughs> answered this last time, Chris, but the the reason for the manholes being in the the tread portion of the path or, or the road is <coughs> not of other facilities or what we have utilities on the west uh, underneath the west curb line and in order to keep that street open to traffic during construction we try to move that sewer yep. as far away from those utilities as possible with allowing one-way traffic throughout the process without shutting down the road completely and it's just it's just the way it it, it ended so we would, have, we would have had to incur a substantial shutdown of the street you would have for a had to shut down period the whole of time, um, as opposed to what we were able to do to maintain traffic for the most part throughout the project. Yep, 100%. Is there anything that can be done in terms of this concern with regard to the slight dip that's you know that, that's experienced when the when the paver had to lift or anything like that? There's no way to really beef up that asphalt or anything like that without... I wouldn't take a chance of doing anything. I mean, I have seen, like, on highway work, coming out with, like, a profile mill and milling areas that are, you know, milling bumps out of the road. Personally, I wouldn't take my chance in doing it, but I could... What does it destroy some of the... So, it's, of the so it comes sure, down I mean, to you're basically going to skim off a portion of the asphalt, tack it, or reseal it, and then you're left with a milled up area of, of a new road, basically. Okay. You know, there are areas of concern that I've had out there that... Reith Riley is addressing. You know, they've milled up some bad areas and we're going to patch them back. But, I mean, it, other than going through there and 
milling some more spots. So it comes down to the difference between a mill machine, or a paver, I'm sorry, a paver and hand uh, placement of, the, of yep. the asphalt material where those laterals were located. Absolutely. And there, there is an extensive amount of utilities in that roadway. It's pretty complex. I think as we all... There was a lot of old stuff under the road. As we all <laughs> navigated the project when we had some other change orders as a result of substantial relocation of utilities and working around utilities um, at various levels throughout the project. Well, all good discussion. What about sure. the rattle on those, some of the manholes? They're shaking when they uh, you go. Yep. Over. And I talked to Mr. Murphy about that before I got in here. I'm going. I marked out probably a handful, seven to ten myself, yeah. that I drove over and felt it. The, the lid's jumping. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I believe is when they did the, all the adjustments on those castings. I mean, they took those things off and put them back on. So they freed up the tack and the asphalt that was placed over the castings at one point. But I'm going to pull up those lids myself make sure everything's clean underneath and I did put out uh, an email to Reese Riley to see if they have any suggestions on how to keep these things down. I don't want to do anything that's going to affect sanitary. I don't want to put anything, any tar or anything underneath the lids where if you guys need to get into a structure, now you can't get the lid off. I think over time, road grime is going to get within there and it's going to Hold it back down. You can, tar the seam, the you can tar the seams, keep it from jumping, and then when they pull it up, they'll have to retire it every time. Is exactly, and it, sometimes sanitary won't be able to get those lids off. I mean, it'll be actual work to get something, you know, get a so lid I guess, off. I, I guess it's my, prime. Yeah. Yeah, my, my general question is, are, are some of the rings warped versus the... I don't believe so. The, the lids, so I think that the lids the risers still... versus the lids. Yes, excuse me. I, I think uh, there might just be some some stone yeah. or a little bit of concrete debris because, because, because that's all concrete fresh concrete. concrete. I got you. I'm sorry. I'm <coughs> just, yeah. Well, I'm just thinking that you know, is the lid going to sit down and square or not, right? Yeah. And if it's if there's some warpage in the underlying ring, it has to be clean, though. Yeah. Gonna, yeah, I, I, I don't foresee that. It right. could be possible, but I, I think there's probably just a little bit of slurry from the concrete that they just poured around those castings that just letting them sit uneven. I'm going to pop them. I'll, I'll lift them up and try to clean them up myself, see what the, see what it looks like. If there's a problem, then they can address it again. Okay. Yeah. And what's the status of the supplemental work with regard to the drainage issue that we... They were going to begin at the apartments? Yeah. They were going to begin today, and okay. the laborer walked in there, and it was wet. Uh, with the seven inches of rain we've yeah. had in the last two weeks, they're trying to get that area to dry up as much as possible. I mean, it was a river yeah. running over the sidewalk last yeah. week. Was all the rain we got? It, I, mean, I only asked because I was asked a question about it, and I I was un I was pretty sure we hadn't begun the project yet. But yeah, they're okay. it's on their radar. Okay. You know, right now, they're doing topsoil sod and trying to put this road back together. They've got three weeks to do it. So, okay. I mean, their completion date is May thirty first. Because if I, I didn't ask the question, he would probably ask the question. So <laughs> it's, it's, I've seen it was still running. Yeah, and, and it's street it's, markings. To, uh, they're addressing that as well. I know, it's raining a lot, too. Yep. It's, and it's they, they, they were set back yeah, the last two weeks with rain, but we, we did an initial punch list, me and John and uh, Bill Haas. We sat down, did an initial punch, punch list for Reith Riley and DNM. They've got a list of 30-something things to do right now. They're working at them on a daily basis. Striping's one of them. Waiting for answers and wait for people to show up and just do it. Okay. So with that, we need uh, we'll need a motion with regard to the if there change order. If there are any other questions, there any other questions? pleasure of the commission. Chairman, I'd move to approve change order number five in the amount of fifty four thousand one hundred thirty two dollars. Support. <coughs> Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. Thank you very much. Yes, we'll have to understand a little bit more about road construction <coughs> and figure out where the risers go relative to the the wheel tread itself. I there guess. was a lot to fit in, um, and it all came down to whether we had to close the road or not. Sure. Yeah, and it would have had an adverse effect on that neighborhood to shut it down yeah, for months and fun. months. It was already rough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, plus we added an extra lane. I mean, if we didn't add the extra lane, it probably wouldn't have caused some of the complications also. So. All right, Mr. Murphy, uh, an update on the bridge. Okay, good evening, Commissioners. Chris Murphy with Structure Point, and, and 
I know that was probably more technical construction information than the, the typical <coughs> meeting uh, as we discussed, but uh, as Rich noted, it was a, a complicated one mile of road, uh, not only with the the existing uh, facilities that were there that we had to keep in place as much as possible while we fixed, replaced, or enlarged uh, those facilities with the new facilities that we put onto the pavement, all while keeping one lane of traffic open at all times. So it worked as, as conveniently as possible for the community uh, during that construction. So I, I appreciate the community's uh, um, uh, a, a tolerance of, of that construction and, and we're, we're very close to delivering the final product and, and uh, for many years of benefit to the community to come. So thank you very much. Uh, also also want to note that in, in, uh, I appreciate the, uh, the investment the commission's made in, into the schools and the computers. Um, as you know, I, I'm an engineer and uh, and uh, I'll be retiring in some years uh, here in the future, and it's good to know that the middle school students in, in the STEM Barker School, uh, hopefully somebody will want to pursue a civil engineering career and be ready to replace me as uh, the job opening becomes available. Uh, it's good to, good to hear. Uh, on the, uh, uh, the um, US 12 bridge over Trail Creek project, INDOT has bid that project. Um, it came in slightly over the engineer's estimate, but not uh, great enough for NDOT to consider it a, a, uh, a bad bid to rebid. So indication is NDOT will award that um, contract uh, to um, Superior uh, Construction. Uh, and they are a, a, uh, an experienced bridge builder uh, for NDOT. Uh, structure points work with them in the past, and, and they do um, uh, very good work. So that was the notification that I got, initial, the, the initial notification I got from Amber Thomas? Correct. Um, that it came in slightly over, but it's within the tolerance? Correct. So they accepted it. Okay. Right. Or Excuse that's me. their intention. I, that was their I intention. don't know if yeah. they okay. approved um, that yet. Because I had gotten that correspondence from her, and I was going to ask you about it, but I just got it. So okay. uh, I hadn't had a chance to follow up with you on that. So I figured that was the case, but I wanted to ask about it. So it's, it's not... Um, I don't think it's out of the, let's see, I was looking for the information. So it's awardable, they, appear, they think it's awardable. Um, what, was our, what was our estimated cost to us originally? I don't remember the exact number, um, it, but it, it was uh, somewhere in that area of uh, four hundred and some odd thousand dollars. Yeah, so it's not out of no. it's not out of like uh, it's within the tolerance, which again the tolerance Correct. is twenty percent. Or uh, no, in that, that, in that tolerance on the overall uh, bidding is uh, usually five percent. Five percent. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Now it the the actual. Um, units of cost to the project that Michigan City is responsible for may have come in at a greater percentage <coughs> on those individual elements than uh, what the overall bid did. But, but it's, not uh, a, it's not a substantial dollar. No, it's not. Okay. And then if they award this, then they'll notify us when we need to submit the payment. Correct. For the for our aspect of the project. And and that will be uh, sooner than later. Yeah. Um, when they award, they'll send an invoice uh, for the full amount. Okay. You need this back? Uh, no, you can okay. have it. <coughs> All right. So, railing design concepts. There we, there we go. Uh, put together a, a number of ideas. Uh, Ted Bleeker, who's a, um, a landscape architect with our department and has some experience with decorative rail elements. Um, I asked him to spend a little bit of time on it um, with some research of elements that would uh, fit the characteristics, the context of, of not only Michigan City, but maybe particularly that area that Trail Creek Bridge is located in. And he put together uh, some ideas uh, for your consideration. Um, these ideas are, are typically bolt-on to the railing system that's in place as opposed to 
other elements that could be fabricated into the structure of the railing itself. Um, and, and I asked them to take a look at that first to see if, if that would, uh, uh, if it would provide some elements that would be of interest, uh, because that is the easiest element to actually attach to the structure. Uh, it's probably less costly as well. Less costly um, to, to um, integrate an element uh, would be more costly in, in the fabrication of the railing itself, the railing structure. Um, so I, I asked Craig to um, present this uh, to each of you uh, this evening uh, for your review, uh, and I open it for any discussion uh, that you might have on particular elements of favor, disfavor. So a simple one before we get into the uh, actual question. How robust are the colors in terms of, you got several of these that are, have images on them. Does that fade significantly over time, or how long does that I, last? I, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I don't know exactly, but um, I, I would assume that these colors are, are typically very robust to be um, uh, available for an outside position uh, that these um, images would have exposed to the elements. Uh, I would imagine over time there would be some fading, particularly of the darker colors. So I guess I'm asking a general question to the Commission, unless somebody else wants to interject something. Or was, is this was this discussed during the original design? Uh, I mean, is this a... Not really. Well, the idea that, you know, well, that there would be a future yes, concept. Presented. Yes, there was. There was always a discussion about a more decorative, pos a more decorative option. Um, and as things went along, um, it was discussed that perhaps there was a way to maybe alternate every other panel or something like that, as opposed to, like we said, the integrated change in the actual shape of the railing itself. Um, so it's always been our intention to use a, def a much more decorative um, method, I guess, of handling, model, yeah. handling the railing than just the standard ra uh, horizontal railing that we have on the project. And as we went along, rather than spend a lot of time before we had to make decisions with NDOT um, on deciding on a far more decorative railing as part of the project base, it was decided that we would explore... Yeah. Um, well, right. I think we just kind of a, this kind of addition. Yeah, thank you. Because <clears> I think originally there was just as we just talked about in Ohio Street. There's so many decisions to be made, and you really want to make them all uh, appropriately. And this seemed to be one that we could put off to the future a little bit, relative to try to tackle at the same time. We're trying to decide what the height of the railing is, and how many rails are on it, and its structural components, and the height of the concrete, and all the other stuff. So. And the spacing I'm talking about doesn't have to be set. That doesn't have to be the way it is. It could be anything we yeah. want. Um, if we wanted to do every four, we could, or something yeah. like that. But it's just a, it was just a way to break up the, um, you know, monotony of just a continuous railing and yeah. right. add, a little, add a little bit of visual interest to the bridge. Right. Um, but it's completely an option. And um, So the question I have, too, is, so, I don't know if we dodged a bullet or what, but I think we got the colors right on the overpass on the expressway with the with the cream and the blue and everything on by the, the mayor's flags. Um, I'm a little sensitive to, at least myself anyway, putting forth an idea for what really is appropriate aesthetically. I mean, and I don't know, it's kind of a little bit of a mayor's call here. Is this something we want to enlist another body to help us with and the group I'm thinking about is the MAC, the Michigan City Arts Commission and at least have them kind of take a look at it unless you guys are really happy with some things. I, I gotta admit I mentioned the blue the chips on the poker chips. I'm I'm not as enamored with that now that I see it. <laughs> so, <laughs> that way. But I asked it to, <coughs> to take a look at it. Right, thank you. You're welcome. I, I do want to note, it, you know, a, a, an element uh, such as a circle um, element with a laminate um, covered uh, image, um, it, as as it may fade or as it may um, uh, deteriorate, be, whatever, yeah, yeah. yeah, be uh, interested in changing out, you could um, take, oh, remove that one and add a replacement nice. one. 
that so we, we could we could put different exactly. images in there in the right. future. We didn't yeah. lock it into the shape of a lighthouse, right? If we use a square or a circle on that, you could. Yeah, that's right. true. That's right. right. If that's any, any of those laminate ones to consider, so you could, could be changed you could out. interchange. That adds some flexibility, but they still look nice. Right. Uh, so, does the commission want to make a decision this evening, or? Get some more input, or put it off till the next meeting. How much or? time do we have, Chris? Uh, this this would uh, be added to the project by change order. Um, you have some time because the railing will be an element that is added last or close to last. It'll be fabricated um, because it is a, a, a lead time item, so the contractor will have it fabricated. But the the actual attachment of the decorative element. Can take place as the railing is. Yeah, so these are mounted. bolt on type of thing. Correct. And then will this be on both sides? Of the it could be. Could be could if we be wanted. Or just on one side. And I mean, on you know, on both uh, sides. Well, yeah, both sides of the bridge, both inside or out. Not if we outside. don't do that, then they'll just be regular railings. Correct. Because at that point, I'm assuming it's going to be at the top of the, the rails. You can change. And and top of the bridge. Top of the bridge, correct. And then that's the most where the wind and exposure snow and everything is going to come and hit it. So I look at it and say maybe this is going to have to be changed every other year or something. That, that, that's weather. a good question, Commissioner. Yeah. I, I, and, I don't know what the expectation and I would, would be. I see the money being spent on changing this when it could just be a rail. That's my answer. So, any, any if, I would suggest we just consider it a little bit more. Sure. Um, it's a lot to I'm not, take in. I'm not really sure, Don, no offense, but I'm not really sure what the MAC would contribute to this, to be honest. I just, I'm just asking a, a defined organization to look at art in the community. I mean, they, we're supposed to be kind we'll of probably end up with sculptures up there <laughs> before it's over. <laughs> yeah. well, they do good work. I, I will note uh, on the last page the, there is shown uh, on an actual bridge the musical notes that are actually sure. stainless steel bolt-on elements right. that um, uh, still could be changed out in the future, but they would be more permanent um, than than the, the actual laminate that would be included within this decorative element. I figured we'd have portraits of all the mayors that we've had in Michigan City over time. Yeah, on there. Me and Pat decided on you just a minute ago. So, uh. Uh, okay, I think we'll put this on a future agenda item then, unless somebody else wants a different recommendation this evening. I, I would invite, certainly, if you have questions to see something further, um, you can notify me directly or notify Craig and we'll compile a list or if there's some questions. The commissioner wants to be on both the committee for this. Anyone want to volunteer for that? Are the rails themselves required to be straight like that, or can they have uh, a wave design to them? Uh, they can have a, a pattern design to them as long as the openings between the, the elements of the railing are kept to the, the appropriate uh, gap, uh, minimum mm -hmm. gap uh, opening, so nobody can actually fall through. So we could have kind of Particularly a wave children. doing kind of swing. Those are... but. Yeah, just to know, those would those definitely would be more expensive. They would, yeah. yes, because you got to do all that bending. In there. Right. Okay, I guess future agenda item. Unless somebody else wants something different. All right. Any questions on the bridge? Thank you. And I do want to remind the commissioners that that at um, your request, our request. Uh, NDOT will be holding off the start of this construction right. until the end of this year so that it's a single season of construction so, in 2020. So you may have mentioned this to the mayor just a minute ago, but about when do we have to make the decision by, if you're your best guess? Oh, I, I, I don't, I think we have several months. Uh, we can Because it's a change order. This. Yeah, there's a change order. Right. Okay. Since so the project's got to be a change order. And it, I don't think it'll necessarily be part of the... Uh, the fabrication of the railing, if it's a bolt-on, um, that can be added as the railing is completed. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, number 11, Engineer's Castle, Amendment 3. 
Mr. Phillips. Okay, so you were, you should have received um, a handout that explains um, the alternate that was uh, this change order is being requested for. Um, on that, you'll if you look at uh, where it says items A, B, and C in the center, it says alternate number four: the structural engineering consultation required due to unforeseen field conditions discovered during demolition. Of the old interior exhibits, structural engineer performed site visit and provide recommendation for roof being clear, bearing condition, deteriorated st steel lintels, and masonry tuck pointing. Uh, and that item is uh, $775. So this was an unforeseen circumstance until we got into the project. There was no way of knowing that this was necessary. And it was, um, uh, it was uh, for whatever reason, was not submitted to us. Um, on time or something like that, you know, when the actual work was performed, and so this is a this kind of is a wrap up item to basically wrap up that project, and uh, it was necessary due to the unforeseen site conditions that were experienced when they were actually doing the construction. Um, so it probably could have been submitted to us earlier, but it just wasn't, and um, but it doesn't make any it doesn't affect, you know, the 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 con you know the the project outcome um, in that it would have had to have been done anyway, just a matter of the timing of when we received this change order. So I would recommend approval of the change order to approve $775 for the consultation and structural engineering assessment in the field. Okay, what's the pleasure of the commission? Motion to approve. Second. <coughs> Second. Any further discussion? This And this will close out the deal, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Oh, thank you. All right, 709. Franklin Street. Okay, so just a quick update. Um, just wanted to let the commission members know. I believe today, if not tomorrow, I, I wasn't out there today because of the just the fact I wasn't able to get out there. But I believe that the the masonry, uh, the preservation of the masonry that we're going to be uh, keeping and reintegrating into the project began uh, today or is beginning tomorrow. Um, and that will be stored uh, in the uh, yard at the Central Ser Central Services Department. Um, so the demolition of, of 709 has officially begun. Um, we received the final approval we needed last week from the Board of Works on that. And the full demolition is expected to begin, um, the actual demolition of the remainder of the building is expected to begin later this month. So just wanted to let you know that that's underway. And so you'll see um, the barricades going up on Franklin Street. Um, this week for the removal of the masonry, and then um, then there'll be a pause in the activity, and then um, the fencing, the actual site fencing that will surround the building for demolition will be installed later this month, and uh, it's anticipated that that will be completed by early June. And the number of lanes blocked? Or Just what? parking spaces. Um, okay. So much the same as when we did the demolition of 701 to 705 Franklin. Um, all we did was uh, blocked the uh, parking spaces from 7th Street south to the east-west alley uh, adjacent to art space. Um, so the two drive lanes themselves weren't affected and won't be affected um, unless there's something unforeseen that happens, but the approval that we received was for the closure of the parking spaces only on the west side of the street, and the fencing will go up along, basically along the, the fencing will go up along the edge of the lane um, like it did for the last demolition. And completion by? Early June. Early June. All right. Uh, any other questions, comments? Um, and that also includes the restoration of the site adjacent um, to regrade the site so that it, we don't have the ponding and, and drainage yeah. issues that we uh, that we had over the uh, winter months. That's all the same contractor. Yep. All right. <coughs> uh, while we're on this related thing, Civic Plaza project update. Just the only thing to report is that we had a series of meetings with our consultants uh, from. Uh, Destination Rapid City uh, last week we had I think it was nine or ten meetings with different stakeholder groups and and, and um, individuals and we believe that those those requests or th that those meetings went very well we received a lot of good input and so what we're going to be doing is going back and kind of fine-tuning the uh, financial information about the management and operations um, pro forma if you will uh, associated with the project and the um, the, the preliminary design for the project and our goal would be to 
uh, I believe in, uh, in at our at our uh, June at our June redevelopment commission meeting, um, or somewhere around our June commission meeting, uh, to have uh, most likely a, a joint presentation to the redevelopment commission and council, um, and that would ultimately be our goal to um, seek the approvals necessary uh, for the bonding on the project. Ultimately, most likely from the redevelopment commission in late June, and then the council in July. So just to give you kind of a heads up of the schedule, we anticipate hopefully uh, beginning that approval process in late June. Okay. So any questions you have, I'm happy to answer, but that's kind of where we're at with the project at this right, point. So we're, we're finalizing the <coughs> capital costs and the operating costs and to review that with the City Council and others. And, uh, and Redevelopment and Commission. Redevelopment Commission, of course, right. Okay. Questions, comments on the plaza? All right, Washington Park. Uh, more with the parking lot, I guess. Jay. Good evening. I promise to make this very short. Okay, as I typically present at these meetings, it's a written progress report of where we're at with the West Parking Lot and the Washington Park Project. Wash the West Parking Lot, if anybody's been out there, has been paved, it's been striped. Someone mentioned the seven inch rain. We've had a lot of rain in the last three weeks, not a drop of rain left in the parking lot, so it was all absorbed by a soil, gar soil garden and the exfiltration system underneath nice. the parking lot, so it's working very well. On Friday at two o'clock, this Friday, we're going to have a walkthrough, and if anybody is interested in walking through, I'll be out there. We're going to be checking out. We'll be developing the punch list. We'll be putting together, writing our a certificate of substantial completion, and from all things that I can see, it looks pretty good. There's a couple things I want fixed, but other than that, you're invited at 2 o'clock this Friday. It's not necessarily a ribbon cutting Friday. This is more of a walkthrough. Right? This is a walkthrough prior to the ribbon cutting, yes. If you want a ribbon cutting. Well, we'll definitely have one after we're convinced that the project is sure. is substantially okay. complete. Clear, but yes. On the Washington Park project, we're moving along with the final completion of the 100% plans and specifications. I anticipate that I will have on my desk a set of 100% plans and specifications for my final review. There probably will be some changes in markups like there always is. The plan is to have the final set completed one week from this Friday. So at that time, I'll have a set of 100% plans and specs. I will submit them to our committee. I'll probably, Craig, I'll probably schedule a meeting or I just might drop them off to your office. But anyway, I'll have a set of final plans and specifications for the city to do with what they would like to do. So we are very, very close to completing it, wrapping up some electrical issues and some architectural issues. It's going to look, well, I mean, eventually it will look beautiful, but that's where I thought I got an invitation for the committee meeting, but I'm not sure. I don't think so. It's such a Oh no! It was for the it was for the walkthrough. For the walkthrough, this part, okay. yes. That's all I have to report. If anybody has any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. It looks wonderful. Just for my two cents, it's a great work. I think it'd be a great addition to the park. So I did notice on your second page, you had two items at the top: the lighting height identification in the west parking lot, as well as a large LED notification sign. Anything to report on that, or is that for future discussion? Or? So, I and Jan K. Yes, um, area northwest of the new pavilion. And that's oh, what I, I know. Oh, yes, the, yes, I know what we're talking about. Long term concern was. Well, this was a long term concern, yes. The visual, you know, what the skyscape looks like. 
Yes. You said, right. I put it on there because at one time we were discussing that lighting and I just left it on the agenda because it is something I believe that we do need to address sometime in the future. That's all. We have set the standard for the lighting for the west parking lot as there will also be a standard set for the main park campus whenever that gets completed. So I would, just as a suggestion, use the same we're type of... on that, right? Yes, sir. I'm That's hoping we're considering, I, I, it's always expense, value proposition, you know, an unobstructed view from the pavilion mm -hmm. to the lighthouse and to Chicago. So. Yeah. Now, there is, um, yes, sir, there is one thing on the back I failed to mention. The landscape architecture provide a, a quotation <laughs> for the landscaping for the two-year maintenance and warranty. I attached it to the back. He gave us both a one-year quote and a two-year quote. It's for your review. I don't expect any decision to be made tonight, but we can Which we did discuss getting that. Um, yes. Right. And I think we were leaning towards the two-year because of the nature of the plantings that we're having installed um, being a rain garden, and it typically takes more than a year to establish a rain garden. Yes. And so I think it was our recommendation that we consider the two-year maintenance um, we didn't include this in the original bid because we didn't include landscaping in the original bid and we thought we were going to come back with a separate quotation for the maintenance that we normally would build into the overall project, but we didn't in this case because of that. Yes. Um, we don't need to take action on this today? Well, landscaping probably needs to start. So, so that, yeah, I mean, It's being installed. It's, it's just a matter yeah. of... The, until substantial completion is finalized, the certificate is issued, it's up to the contractor to maintain the plants. <coughs> so there's going to be some punch list items that they're going to need to take care of. So what I would suggest is if you need to review it, review it, and then maybe at the next special meeting we can accept it then, or if you wanted to accept it tonight, we could accept it tonight. I think the concern was we wanted to have this as part of the overall package rather than as a one-off for yes. maintenance is where we were headed. Yes. So how they can handle that or not, right? Yes, yes. that's correct. So, so the project. it is part of the overall project. It's Let's be clear, it's all part of the overall project. It's just because we took landscaping out, right. that would have normally been in the original bid, right. um, the, you know, the master bid, but in this case it wasn't because that was a separate item that we handled. So I'm assuming because they did on this before well, final they did, completion. The people, the, the, the two vendors who, who provided the bids were, did not do it correctly. Correct. So we wrote them out of the first one, then came back with what we did last month, right. and then we're doing again quotes what we did last month, and then quotes as it relates to the uh, maintenance aspect of the, of the landscaping. So maybe we should just take action project. at the next meeting on this. Why not? Why well, I think numbers aren't great. Say is the fact the numbers aren't that, I, That's why I kind of... Why, that's why I brought it up, and the numbers are what they are. They're not going to change. So just so we have to do this anyway. What I'm hearing from Jay, though, is the fact that you know we're not we're not in any rush to give this. The longer we can delay in giving that, the longer our maintenance agreement is going to last. So, the maintenance agreement will start when we approve the certificate of substantial completion, which means that the punch list that's attached to the certificate of substantial completion is completed. So what I could do is maybe we could tentatively approve it now, and in two weeks I could write the change order. Maybe at your next special meeting I could have the change yeah. order ready, and then we can go from there. Yeah, that's why. Would that work? That would work. I, okay. I, I, you know, like you said, the number's not going to change, and yeah. so we're going to do this anyway. And I would recommend two years because of the nature of the plannings. Yes. Um, given the fact that it's rain garden, um, and that does require a substantial amount of care mm -hmm. um, and meticulous maintenance over the first two years to establish properly. Okay. okay. What's the pleasure of the commission? Move <coughs> to approve. Two year. Seconds. Moved and seconded. All those in favor of adding seventeen thousand five hundred dollars to the project for uh, a two year maintenance agreement, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. Thank you. Okay. So you'll have that for us at our next meeting. Wait, what? The special meeting or the next meeting? E well, we'll have a pretty heavy schedule. Honestly, we're going to have a pretty sch heavy schedule on the special meeting, so if we don't do it till June 10th, I don't think it's going to be a problem. They don't look like it, though. Yeah, yeah. let's just do it at the regular June yeah, meeting. It, it, no, you should come back two or three times this thing. Yeah, so, right. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll get it. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. So, 
South Shore or 11th Street <coughs> Station? Is this yours, uh, Craig? Well, I thought somebody was going to be here from Global. Um, I think so. I see the image. So I can explain the one pretty right. easily. There were, uh, so the if you look at alternate number two or number one, um, you should have a handout from Marcus Electric. Electric that has a red circle around it. Um, so if you look at alternate number one, we had a request from Nikti to be able to use the um, the glass um, enclosure, you know, the sign holders, basically at the station um, because we're the seasons upon us. So I, um, I suggested that we go ahead and order the materials necessary to do the replacement of the glass uh, for the $1,943. So, we need to, uh, so I would request that you ratify that um, at this meeting. And then the scope of the additional work was, I believe, at the mayor's request, if I'm not mistaken, that we consider reinforcing the letters at the 11th Street station so that they don't, we don't have the same ongoing problem we've been having with people kicking them off or standing on them or whatever. The idea is basically that they're providing us a, a stronger angle iron um, behind the letters uh, so that uh, it wouldn't be as easy for anybody to damage them. Um, and they attached they attached a drawing that would show how that uh, would be anchored if I'm on the third page of the handout. Um, so the quote for that work uh, to be done by Marquis Electric would be $4,692. And then, like I said, I would ask you to approve alternate number one, given the request from Nikti to be able to use those sign, uh, those those sign um, boxes, if you will. Um, what happened? What happened was when the project was completed, there was some um, film that was not removed from the glass, and it fused to the glass because over time the sun basically fused the cover or the the, the you know the uh, film to the glass. And in order to replace, so the, the to replace that um, was the cost of the nineteen hundred forty three dollars to replace the the glass for those. And there's three panels. Um, I don't remember those dimensions off the top of my head, but I think they're standard poster size. Um, so essentially, that's the request. Like I said, um, I thought that somebody was going to be here from global to go over this with us in a little bit more detail but you can see where they want to add the angle iron behind the lettering yeah. and there's a blow-up drawing to show that so that we reinforce the lettering so I see the, I see the reinforcement I guess the general question I have is does the line distract from the lettering itself the bar yeah so it's a good question Maybe you can adjust the paint in between the letters or something. It would only well, it would yeah, it would only go halfway from the of the distance from the from the wall to the edge of the lettering. Oh, okay. So you probably because you can see here if you look at the okay. blow up drawing, it, it would still you'd be visible for sure. But when you look at this, you can see where the where the back wall. It's yeah. a, you know here you can see it better because you can see the actual brick. Right. And then. Uh, if you look at the the uh, the, the blow-up, you can see the angle that butts up against the brick. It only goes halfway the dip, basically roughly halfway the distance between yeah. the wall and the edge of the you know the edge of the base of the letter. Um, but we're doing this for looks, so I mean, it should. But it's obviously a problem, an ongoing problem. Well, yeah, we might have to put some restrictions on allowing people to sit on the edge of it, but. Anyway, I just wonder if somebody should look at it as we it's put up or not. Or um, I guess one question is it continuous? One thing that's not clear to me is it if it's. I guess it is continuous. I, it does look continuous. It does. It is, yeah, it does look continuous. I, just, it, I mean. I, I get it as long as it's not a distraction, so I don't know if you have to. As long as somebody's paying attention to that detail, it's okay. Me or, yeah. or one or two of us could take a look at it or something or whatever. Do you think maybe we should just put this up for June and have I honestly sure haven't had. Someone is here to speak on this? Yeah, I was hoping that they'd be here to speak on it, and I don't know why they're not. 
they received a copy of the agenda, so perhaps we just hold off on this one. And that, or I mean, how soon? With, with the special, the well, the special meeting, meeting we can handle it at the special so. meeting. <laughs> well, it's it's been in dismay for quite some time already. That's the point. I, I can mean, ask them to be months. in the special meeting. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. To address it. Okay. That's um, a good idea. I mean, I mean that's I my basic question: on is is it going to look better when it's done or worse? <laughs> well, it's not going to. I mean, it's not going to look. Yeah, that's what's happening. They're sitting on there, then the kids are standing on them, and then they're giving away the, the string. And it's definitely not going to look they as aesthetic. The base and just moved it in tighter and took a lot of the width off the top. You still see the, the base of it is wide. You butt it up, you wouldn't have to be able to stand on it. It would be a lot tighter. Yeah, why don't we have them, why don't we have them attend the special meeting um, next Tuesday and... Uh, Discuss it more because honestly, I didn't put this together. I, you know, this was. Oh, well, that's something that's going to be in a I haven't so. had a chance to review yeah. this with them. Um, yeah, unless somebody feels differently, we'll put it on a special agenda. All right. It's uh, necessary. Well, I guess to answer your question, Pat, I think the goal is is they're backlit letters, and if you press the letters wow. up against the wall, they're no longer backlit. Oh. So that's why they're that's why they float like they do. Yeah. I understand. So I understand yeah. what they're trying to achieve. So they're trying to get get it so that the letters still float. I wonder if, yeah, my concern, I guess, is that they're not. That you won't you won't have the same backlit effect if you. Well, that could happen too. So the, cut, the, the angle iron could actually uh, block the light. Who knows? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Unless you put cuts in the angle iron or something like that to customize, you know, the spaces between the letters or something. I, I don't know. It's just, I think we need more information. Everybody's nodding, so, okay, fine. Uh, item 16, <coughs> Mr. Phillips. Uh, this is just to, so that for the record um, and for the minutes, to, we acknowledge the receipt of the annual TIF management report that the commissioner and I submitted uh, prior to the deadline of April 15th. You have a copy of the summary of the report that's submitted right. to the state. So we just need to note for the record that um, it's been received by the commission and it's in the minutes. So, in, in essence, it is that we have defined projects to use the uh, precious TIF dollars that come into the Redevelopment Commission to be used for the betterment of the city. That's this actually has to do with reporting what we did last year. No, last year. Okay. So, what this is is by TIF, um, we give uh, information about the type of TIF, personnel that, that work for or associated with the board. Uh, for the commission, um, the total revenues and expenditures um, for each TIF, and then that's broken down by type um, as per the requirements of statute. And then um, the fund balances uh, at the end of the year, and I believe debt payments that were made for each of the TIFs, uh, for each of the bonds within the TIFs. So that's essentially what this is. It's a okay, report so that's, of that's 2018. Different. Okay, 2018, and we will have to make a 2019 communication, correct? Next year. And then... Oh, it's always after the fact? I thought we... It's always uh, after the fact. Um, the only thing different is this upcoming June 10th report to the overlapping taxing units. That has to do that's with... That's what I was talking That about. has to do with our plan, how to, that's how what to spend the funds. Okay, so that's... The this is thing. reporting to the state. <clears throat> okay, reporting. This, say what we did, June 10th will be reporting where we're going future. Correct. Okay. And then uh, City Council also received the same report. Um, okay. I believe at their last minute as correspondence, La or their last meeting as correspondence. All right, so Just we need to acknowledge <coughs> the receipt. Is that <coughs> take a vote? No, no we're good. Okay. Just, as long as it's, so it's in the minutes, minutes, that's all that matters. Thank you. Any questions on the TIF management report? All good. Okay. Report by legal counsel. Oh, excuse me. Forgot an agenda, agenda item, and it kind of does refer to. Probably report by legal. Our addendum to board open bids for offer to purchase property located at 6000 South Cleveland Avenue. As you recall, two months ago, uh, we just we, we wanted to move forward to see if we could um, transfer this property that we own to see if there was any interest in anybody who wanted to purchase it. There's a process that you have to go through in terms of uh, putting out a public notice to that effect and then opening a, comp uh, a sealed bid or bids uh, for the purpose of that property. The um, 
we put down the minimum bid on that would be the mid midpoint between the or the average of the two appraisals we received, which would be two hundred ninety-eight thousand five hundred dollars. We received one bid on May tenth, twenty nineteen, at nine twenty-four a.m. And just to clarify for everyone, six thousand South Cleveland. About where is that? Across, Across the, street the street from the fire department. Thank not you. the fire department. <laughs> okay. Uh, not the fire department. So this is um, on the there was west a, side of the street. West there was apparently some confusion because right. Beacon reports the fire department's address as six thousand. Also right. Even okay. though it's actually five thousand South Cleveland. Uh, this is the land across the street to the west. And this also has, in addition to usable prop, there's also wetlands, and we've also gone through with having a wetland delineation report submitted as well. So, thank you. The only bid received was from the Fraternal Order of Police. Um, submitting on May 9th of 2019. Their offer was for $50,000. Now, Having said that, um, by law, you know we have to start off with a with a minimum asking price of two hundred ninety eight thousand five hundred dollars based on the appraisals. The fact that we have an offer here for fifty thousand um, dollars, we cannot accept within this framework. So, uh, and again, the law allows you to either accept a bid. Uh, reject a bid or table a bid, given the fact that the bid is only fifty thousand dollars and the minimum bid required is two hundred ninety eight thousand five hundred. Uh, my recommendation to you would be to reject this bid, and if it is the interest of the commission to continue to explore ways in which to um, convey this property, sell this property, that either myself or one of the commissioners could then engage in conversations with the Fraternal Order Police uh, as to a negotiated price. Um, so that's kind of what you have with this tonight. That's as far as we can right, go so with it. My suggestion is to take it two things. So your recommendation is the rejection of the bid. I think you want to reject the 50. You just don't have the authority to accept the 50,000 bid. All right, so um, pleasure the commission on the rejection of the bid. I would move that we reject fifty thousand dollar bid because uh, it's unacceptable and yeah, it, just, it just doesn't comply with state law. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Again, that okay. well, second, I guess for that motion and second. Everybody second. So oh, thank you. It doesn't mean right. that we cannot engage in conversations with them for less than the appraised value. It just means at this ju this juncture of the procedure, we just can't. Should we have that as a separate motion, though? The, yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, we have a motion to second. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, to your next point, Alan. The second point. I think we already had had somebody working on this, if I recall. Or the I've been talking with them about this, and I, and I laid out for them the procedure. Um, so I'm not surprised that they submitted something. I am su somewhat surprised at the relatively low dollar amount. Um, but there's certainly... You have you like I say at this point we can take nothing for take no further action do nothing, uh, or we can engage them in additional conversation and see if we want to try to sell the property. Yeah, I would move that we uh, engage them in additional uh, negotiation conversation in regards to their acquisition potential acquisition of this property. I don't think we need to make a motion on that as much as you're basically giving me authorization to follow up with them and I can follow the report back. So make sure everybody, colleagues, agree. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. Yes. And okay. is there a commission that wants to work with them on this specifically? Or I take that up afterwards? I yeah. don't have a problem. We can take it back for us. Okay. So. No, I'll keep you posted. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Pat? That's right. Well, if that changes, we'll let you know. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything else from legal counsel? Yes, you do have one. Two I know. Other, two other things. Um, this is more just I want to set a record on something. As you recall, back in January, I think of this year, we acquired uh, a parcel uh, with an address of 355 East Highway 20, which is right out there behind the car dealership and is part of the uh, overall developments going on out there in terms of, of roads, um, no, just the overall development of that Ameriplex complex. Um, unbeknownst to us at that time, we also acquired a tenant. Uh, who was living in the house. Um, the Redevelopment Commission does not have the authority, legal authority, to enter into a landlord-tenant relationship. Um, we can't accept rent. It, it, it's just, it's, 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 it's kind of a unique situation that we knew nothing about. Um, so, to protect ourselves, first of all, we have, uh, I did inquire of um, 
with, with our insurance carrier to ensure the fact that that person, if he gets injured out there, would be insured under the general liability policy of the, of the city. Uh, and then secondly, what I have done is given him notice, uh, basically following the rules of what you need to do to evict somebody uh, and what the process is. Even though this seems really elementary, uh, he still has a right to um, due process, particularly given the fact that he did have an unofficial or a month-to-month -month tenancy with the uh, person who we bought the property from. So what that process basically means is officially giving him notice by certified mail that he needs to vacate, which I did back on April 18th. Um, if he's still there, then we will give him formal notice to vacate or notice to quit through the Sheriff's Department, May 18th, May 19th, something like that. Uh, he has 10 days in which to respond to that. If he's not vacated by then, then I'll file a formal uh, eviction complaint against him. And um, but again, the important part on this is the fact of, of we need to, we can't have this kind of relationship, and we need to make sure we're protected, which is why I wanted to establish the record that. We are doing, once we became aware of the situation, we're doing everything we, we have to do so as to get out of the situation. So that's just to update you on that. Once um, he has vacated, whether it's through in response to the letter I wrote or the sheriff's service, uh, I will be sure to let you all know about that. And then you did mention that the city has no liability for him. City does have liability on that property. We yes. we do, and we performed an inspection of the property. Yes, uh, and we ensured that it has working uh, smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors, and the equipment in the home is generally working properly. Uh, and we did verify, as as Attorney Sirenek said, that, it, that he's covered by our uh, our general liability policy okay, so, for the city. So we do have some exposure here for short term. Well, we, you know, you always do, right. I guess, but, it, but we're we've taking, done everything we can. I, I, we're taking, acceptable, I steps. To we're taking yeah. acceptable steps to get ourselves okay. out of this situation. Right. And right. providing a defense for <clears throat> the situation we need to talk about. So, thank you. And then the final thing was, I'd give you a report on the Trail Creek litigation. Um, we had a mediation session with three <coughs> of the respondents, or three of the defendants, uh, that occurred on April 23rd. We reached tentative approval to two of the respondents. Um, one would be with um, Weber Sign for $60,000. Um, let me stop, I guess, at that one too. Weber Signs did have a uh, plant down there that did leach contaminants into the Trail Creek property. They were named as defendants in our lawsuit. Um, We've reached this agreement with them, um, given the fact that while we know that they were contaminants, we don't know what the percentage would have been of contaminants, and rather than maybe come up with something more than 60000 maybe come up with something less than 60000 then we just formally agreed to a 60000 which I would also say comes to the point of pretty much where their insurance carrier was as well. Um, so the record, so at this point, like I say, there's been a tentative uh, acceptance of this agreement between the city and and uh, at a mediation and the uh, and Weber sign has responded uh, subject to approval at this meeting. So I would ask your approval uh, for that sixty thousand dollars settlement agreement with Weber signs. So this is for them to pay us those amounts. Yes, and it's unlikely for us to recover more than that. This is a fair yes. negotiated settlement. Yes. With yes. Them. And, and it's money we didn't have. Before. And it's money we didn't have. <laughs> right. So, okay. Right direction. Thank you. So what's the pleasure of the commission? Motion to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor, signal by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Second uh, agreement is with uh, an individual named Sheila Casper. <coughs> one of the daughters of the Aaron Craft Manufacturing Company, who was one of the defendants in the case as well. Aaron Craft and um, Verma, those defendants have been very difficult to deal with. One, because we don't know who they are where they, or where they are more, so getting, getting notice has been tough. Verma, for example, we have a default judgment. We've already obtained a default judgment for them, just no dollar amount yet, and don't know that we'd ever be able, at least as we sit here right now, don't know that we'd ever collect on that because we don't know where they are. 
The Aaron Kratz has also been difficult to deal with, only from the viewpoint is because we have several officers, we have several partners, and we have the owner of Aaron Kratz who resides in the country of India. Uh, prior to relocating out of the country, divested himself of all property, uh, real or personal, uh, and all assets in this country, so we really have nothing to go after there as well. Um, we actually kind of lucked into a little bit with Sheila Casper in the fact that, um, again, when we started this lawsuit and named Aaron Kraft as defendants, and they are culpable, um, we had nobody to go after, so we kind of found Sheila. However, Sheila has a pretty good defense as it relates to her personally in the fact that she was four years old um, when this contamination occurred. Uh, so even though she was the head of the company as a four-year-old, uh, it's kind of hard to think that we're going to get much from her beyond uh, the agreement of $30,000. The important thing to remember, though, on this settlement is while this releases Sheila Casper, it does not release Aaron Craft. And that as we are able to continue to work on finding either insurance <coughs> for Aaron Craft or other partners or heirs to Aaron Craft, we <coughs> still would have an active interest in, against them. I would finally point out with regards to Ms. Casper is that she's been, as part of the mediation process, also was uh, of assistance uh, in terms of trying to find other partners, other family members, anybody but herself. It's a, it's a good family that's sticking mm -hmm. So I'd say the editorial comment. But she has been helpful to us um, since that and has allowed then uh, Plu Shadley to actually subpoena more additional information as it relates to other potential partners that we've been able to find records of as well as potential uh, insurers. Uh, so what I'm asking for tonight would be the uh, approval of that agreement uh, that we entered with her subject to approval at a public meeting of $30,000. So, in anticipation of your first question, <laughs> like you did on the last one, this is very fair for okay. us. If I were saying, if I were asking you to approve a settlement with Aaron Craft for $30,000, that would not be fair. Thank you. <laughs> but $30,000 as it relates to this particular individual, <coughs> to leave her out of it then, uh, is, is a very, very fair. It's kind of like a cooperative witness, right? <laughs> yeah, it's always <laughs> looking at it. Yeah, yeah. All right, so do we want to accept $30,000? What's the pleasure of the commission? I'd move to accept, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Support. <coughs> if it's seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signal by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And just one last thing to say about Trail Creek litigation, as we've talked about for the better part of the past year, you know, Begley Company is the largest contaminant. Um, they were at the mediation. We didn't reach any type of, we didn't come close to reaching agreement with them, only because of the fact that their experts' opinions were so different from our experts' opinions. Um, so we will be having another mediation. Um, I think the dates have been May 22nd or May 23rd, something like that, or May 29th. Um, later on this month, and hopefully we'll reach some kind of agreement on that. Right. So maybe maybe some, some <coughs> resolution of this long-term issue. We're going to have resol we're going to have long-term resol or we'll have a resolution to this long-term issue no later than the end of October. Um, maybe we can have a resolution before then with a known resolution. Yes. Okay. So a it's it's an accounting question for the for Craig or for. Alan, so these <coughs> funds that are coming in to us, they're, they're not TIF dollars. And I had some discussion on some other issues with um, some folks that are actively involved in other read home commissions. And there may be some value in us setting these funds into a different bucket, mm -hmm. which may have more flexibility for use rather than our TIF funds. In the past, um, right, in the past, our... Properties that uh, funds that we received through property sales or through other settlements, it's my understanding those went into the operating account, and the operating account doesn't have the same strings attached to it as far as the use of right. TIF dollars because these are not TIF dollars. So we can explore one of two things: we can either explore just having those funds um, uh, put into the operating account or set aside a special fund that we can use, some sort of a flex other flexible fund. But we would need to discuss that with the controller's office. 
What about in regards to the, <clears throat> their offsetting costs of remediation and assessment work that's being done, though, that you're using TIF dollars for? If, well, the okay, so in the case of... Okay, that's a good point, actually. I, I, I just asked the so, question because I've heard that we may get some flexibility. Sales are clear. That th Those can go into the operating fund. Um, so if we end up settling on a price you know, of some sort for 6000 South Cleveland, we would definitely put that back into the operating fund. Um, I would, yeah, I would strongly request that if we settle, if we're able to settle with um, Begley, and in the, I guess in this case with regard to Aaron Craft and Weber, because the, the funds that were expended to pursue those claims against those companies came out of North TIF funds, but hopefully those would be able to go back into North TIF funds to reimburse us. I mean, we're out, we're out to the tune of $500,000 in the case of Begley at this point, you know, for vapor intrusion and remediation and all the related costs. And that has put a, that's a big hit on the, on the TIF, sure. on the North TIF funds. So I would hope that we will be able to reimburse the North TIF funds accordingly. I just think it's worth looking at the accounting and to extract the most uh, flexibility we can. So, all right. All right. Anything else? Questions for council? <coughs> all right. Uh, report by director. Uh, just, I have two items. First one is very brief. Um, just wanted to let the commission members know at the request of Councilman Stimley, uh, I will be providing an update on the annual report which we submitted to the City Council last uh, last month, and you all received last month as well. Uh, but I'll be doing that um, at the Council meeting on May 21st. May 21st. Um, like I said, just going over kind of an overview of that annual report for the at the request of Councilman Stanley, who I see is in the audience. So um, I'll be presenting that to them at that meeting. Uh, and I guess sub I guess submitting a request uh, for an officer's update, a report of other city officers and departments, I guess is the way that that will be done, is most likely at the front end of the meeting. So just a heads up on that. And the second thing is a small request that's come before us uh, from the EDC and Clarence Hulse is with us this evening. Um, essentially, what this is is a request to help us, for us to help pay for uh, a prospectus related to the opportunity zones that were recently established through the, the legislation and uh, that allowed the creation of the zones. We were awarded three census tracts as opportunity zones, if I'm not mistaken. And I'll let Clarence explain in more detail what he's what he's requesting from the um, from the commission to kind of move along the ability for us to use the opportunity zone. Um, designation to our uh, greatest extent. So, Clarence. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, thank you for taking the time out to listen to me. And uh, um, Opportunity Zone is a uh, creation of the federal government. It was created in the 2017 uh, tax uh, law. And we were fortunate to be able to get uh, three. Uh, it was part of the tax law. Uh, we found out uh, early 2018. And we were able to discuss with this with the uh, state of Indiana to submit we actually submitted six areas, um, but we have to negotiate um, down to three. And uh, uh, what they are, if you're in, the, in real estate, pretty much it's a, like a 10-year, 1031 exchange. It allows you to invest money in an area uh, where, and then over 10 years, uh, pay little or no taxes. And allow allows you to reinvest. The laws have been updated twice so far. The current last set of our rules allow you to operate a business now and save your money. Within, the, within those areas. So, but it's a tax law, federal tax law, so I tell people, get a CPA and attorney to help you go through all this stuff. I'm giving you kind of the, high, the highlights. This is this corporate, corporate and personal taxes. Exactly. Not real estate taxes. Not real estate taxes, exactly. Um, so, what we have done so far is uh, my, my staff, from the EDC, city staff, uh, mayor's office, an attorney, we got together, put together documents, got the, the zone um, packet submitted um, last year, uh, by March 30th, uh, July 2018, we got the designation, uh, so celebrated it, and then in October of 2018, we had a big um, seminar. We invited uh, business people, investors, brokers to come to Business City. Uh, we had about 50, showed up, and provided breakfast, talked about what can be done with this zone. Um, earlier this year, in March 2019, uh, Business City was rated in the 90th percentile for investment across the country, which there's over 4,000 um, zones, and we were in the 90th percentile for investment. So after um, March of this year, we started getting phone calls about what's going on in Michigan City. 
uh, people from Chicago, New York, Detroit, Atlanta, asking questions. The issue we have right now is we don't have anything to present to them. We, we, got, we can talk to stories, we can talk about what's going on, but um, we were looking at what some of the best practices across the country, and we're seeing cities are putting together prospectus on what's going on in the communities. They're, they're highlighting properties that are either blighted or um, empty, two or, two or three acre lots, uh, old buildings that want to get reinvested. And so one of the things I asked uh, the chairman and the uh, Craig is, can you guys help us defray some of the costs? We looked at what, putting out there to have somebody do it for us. They're talking 30 to 40 grand. We're like, okay, we can't do that. So we've done a lot of the heavy lifting, the research. Uh, we're looking for somebody to help us um, put together the graphics, the templates, the mapping, and that type of stuff. So the uh, cost I told Craig, we went to somebody local, it cost about $7,000 for us to do all that, plus the printing and all that kind of stuff. So that was the request was to come before you guys, so I have for $7,000 to help us defray the cost of putting this together. Um, what I sent around first uh, was the three zones, um, give it a, the pretty much northern uh, Michigan City. Uh, when we had made the first request, it was all the way to Highway 20 across to um, 212, and we were told it couldn't be that large. So we had to shrink it down, and we, we made a strategic choice to put the three zones that intersect the future train station. We felt that that's where you can maximize the most investment in the city. And so it's pretty much looking at Highway 12, portion of Franklin Street, um, west to the hospital, and it goes on the west west area. So it covers, I'd say, 95% of the North, North TIF. Includes the old Barker, uh, the old Barker, Haskell Barker plant. Yes. Uh, off of uh, West Barker Avenue as well. So, so yeah, yeah, I'd say it covers over 90% of the, of the, North, the North TIF. And so the properties that we will highlight are probably all properties within the TIF. Uh, all uh, brownfield sites or uh, old buildings, empty, empty lots that we think could be developed into mixed use or uh, multifamily or uh, commercial concerns, industrial concerns. And so we're trying to put together something that's professional that we can give out to investors from across the country when they call. Here's what's going on in Michigan City. Here's some properties you can even look at. And here's what's going on in terms of numbers and population, where the city is going. But it gives a better a, a better um, portrayal of Michigan City. So we're excited about where we're going, and we're just going to want to help you guys help us out to move this forward. And like I said, we're doing the heavy lifting. I've been talking to Craig and Skylar a lot and getting some of those areas we, we want to highlight. Uh, my staff and I are doing a lot of the research. So the heavy lifting has been taken by staff. We just need to have somebody to make, us, make it look pretty. We've, identif we've identified a majority of the properties already. Um, exactly. We've... Uh, put maps together internally as best we can to try to help people understand where these, you know, these places are located. But we're at a point now where we just need to have a much more professional presentation of that information. So yeah. we're I can send you a copy of that well, presentation. It's actually seventy-five received. pages long, but I, I didn't have time to print you the whole thing tonight. But uh, this Chicago has their own. Every, every city's got their own, and we would like to do something professional for Michigan City. Well, I, I like the idea of having some defined properties. I was a little sensitive when I first heard about this, whether or not. This would be just a come to Michigan City and look around versus mm -hmm. no. actual so maps, properties, highest and best use potentials yeah. that could be invested yeah. in. We also are attending a June 19th seminar or um, in the Chicago um, Brownfield and Operating Zone um, Investment Seminar, and you can actually pitch sites at that seminar. So there'll be investors that you can pitch to. So we're trying to get this done before June 19th because it's a rare opportunity for us to be in Chicago for a day, okay. and you can catch the sign up to present your properties. To investors, so we're trying to get this done like ASAP. So we didn't have this on the agenda, and I'm sensitive to people getting to review materials. So we could either tentatively do something tonight, or postpone it till May 21st. We have a special meeting that's just next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. So is that is that still doable? I mean, I yeah, think we're we're, like we're doing a lot of work right now. So we, yeah. we, were like, we we know we, we got to get something done. Right. So what is black and white? But we prefer something classic. Yeah, of so. course, yeah. Oh, right, right. <laughs> but it's it's clearly directly you know related to the TIF district, and obviously the advancement of these parcels advances the overall TIF district, yeah. and the uh, the likelihood of of increasing the ability to provide economic development opportunities within the TIF district. So that's the question that Alan would ask me. <laughs> so, so to the commission, do we want to wait till May twenty first? Do you want to take some action this evening, or what's in our opinion? It's a relatively small dollar amount, um, it, you know, $7,000. I motion to approve the $7,000. Support. Newman seconded. Any further discussion? 
I suggest we would like to see at least a draft of this thing, maybe whenever it comes out. We will shoot it to you probably before the meeting. We probably can't wait for a meeting, so I can send you a draft with everybody out. Look that'd at be, it. That'd be great. But so, I can't wait for a meeting to. All right. Any <laughs> questions or comments? <laughs> well, thanks for your leadership, Clarence. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for waiting through for the meeting too. It's much appreciated. All right. Uh, any other comments by the director? No, nope, that's all I have. All right. Comments by the public. Oh, too, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Councilman Simley. Uh, good, good evening tonight, um, Commissioners. I just had a few comments. I wanted to. Uh, Proposed the redevelopment commission. I know um, earlier this evening we heard about the the railing there over the bridge going to blue chip. I heard um, different things such as a possibly a coin theme for the panels, um, such as uh, music notes. Uh, one thing you might want to take into consideration too with the Washington Park Zoo being right there, possibly doing a uh, zoo images and maybe every fifth or sixth panel putting something like visit Washington Park Zoo. It's just a thought. Um, I also want to address the issue of uh, Barker and Tilly bond and cash flow report. I'd like to see a copy sent to each council member if that would be possible. We can do that. I don't see any. Sure. We can do that. Yes. And uh, one other thing I'd like to address tonight is the Riverfront uh, liquor licensing. Um, I remember years ago why it was created. You know, it was created for the Trail Creek Corridor there over by Wal McLean and um, through the years, it got expanded once, then it got expanded again. Um, I want to thank uh, thank you for sending me the rules and regulations of the Riverfront District. Uh, when you look at the rules, you know they do have a written commitment with the city when they sign this. When you give out these uh, liquor licenses, uh, they're for upscale nature businesses and restaurants, and it says uh, non-transferable, which. I know they're not, but I remember um, with the Yacht Club, they already had four owners. And also with the old train station, I think they went through three or four owners also. So, you know, they continue to get them at the same place. I believe uh, when we increase, increase these liquor licenses, we're just watering them down for the whole city. Uh, I believe there's no limit on what the redevelopment can dish out with the liquor licensing. Like I said, I'm 100% uh, for business, but I believe um, sometimes this is not the way to go. Uh, when you look at the rules, too, they're supposed to be open 320 days, which is if you just close one day a week, that eliminates them with the 52 weeks in a year. So I just tell you to take a look at this. Um, once again, like you said, it's for upscale restaurants. I believe um, the other businesses that have the liquor license in town are suffering from this. And just keep that in consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. So, Mr. Cernak, would you address the license? Yeah, Johnny, question? just to let you know that uh, <laughs> we do, first of all, you mentioned that the um, different owners of the uh, Yacht Club. Every time, and I'm only aware of three, but every time the first one came, um, we, we, it was grand. That was actually before my time. When the second one came, we terminated the first one at the same time and then approved that one. When the second one left, we terminated that agreement and started a new agreement for that. So we've not tra we've been very uh, vigilant about not transferring those um, uh, those licenses. The other um, you mentioned the old train station or the uh, the, the Washington uh, one hundred Washington. Um, we did, we were aware of that one also, and I inquired on that. And while they went through a different name change, they kept the same corporation. So technically, uh, they did not transfer that liquor license. But we, we, we inquired on it. Um, they got pissed off about it too, but, but, but we inquired on it and, uh, and made sure that they were doing things by the rules. And to my knowledge, that's the only time that's happened. But if it ever comes up, you know, and somebody's aware of that, we, because, yeah, we don't want that being transferred as well. So as far as I know, everybody that has a liquor license at this point is the original request or the original awarding of that license to them. Nothing has been transferred uh, without our approval and, and 
we've never approved a transfer for that matter. And then with regard to the question about the operate days of operation, I know that there have been a couple cases where we've had special requests that have come before us to modify that, and those modifications were granted. Um, I am aware. I am aware of uh, another situation where maybe that didn't happen, and we need to follow up on that. And so we will. I, th I think all the ones in place right now, though, are open. There might be one that we need to follow. Three sixty-five, although you know, with we holidays had, and things like that. Yeah. But, so we'll look into it. We'll, all right. Thank we'll you. review the current licenses and make sure that we don't have any issues with regard to that. Thank you. And thanks for hanging in there for this for the whole meeting. Too. It's much appreciated. Craig, correct me if I'm wrong. There is limits on how many licenses can be issued. Correct. In the ordinance, there's no limit. No. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, any other public comments? Public comments. All right, commissioner comments. Any comments from the commissioners? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just that uh, our special meeting on the 21st. I uh, just want to kind of give everybody heads up that uh, we we're looking uh, real. Uh, aggressively right now at road conditions and so we'll be addressing some uh, uh, road uh, projects in the south tiff and in the north tiff so that'll be one of our discussion topics just want to kind of and of right. course we're looking also and I'll be approaching the city council uh, uh, about some additional funding through uh, uh, the riverboat for uh, road projects citywide also so there's a lot of road conditions we're very aware of that are you know uh, one of the things that was discussed, you know, and this is a community crossing project, but all of Tall Timbers will be paved, which is about, just about $2 million right there and alone in uh, Springland Avenue and all the side streets and cul-de-sacs out there. But it's very much needed. Uh, also, Village Road project residual from the uh, South Ohio Street project from TIF dollars of the uh, storm sewer uh, on Village Road, uh, and then separately street paving as much as we possibly can from Ohio Street to 421 on Village Road, which will uh, be another uh, nice uh, over a million dollars into the Southgate neighborhood. Um, and then, uh, I guess lastly, what the status of the 11th Street Station, uh, plywood, uh, did we ever get a response on that? I don't want to leave that alone because it looks so bad. Sorry, yes, and thanks for reminding me. Yes, we did get an estimate from Deutscher uh, Construction. I will, uh, Debbie, can we add that to the uh, agenda for the special meeting, make a note to add that to the special meeting agenda? Because we do have that estimate. Okay. Thanks for the reminder on that. Yep, thank you. <clears throat> Any other commissioner comments? All right, uh, so just a note, too, on May 21st, our tentative time for the meeting will be an hour earlier. The plan will be to have it at 4 p.m., Assume they'll be in this quarters or as here or EOC, and right? that was so that we could accommodate the amount of meeting we needed in order to get out of here in time for the city council. Um, city council. Okay. All right. Well, uh, things continue to look bright in Michigan City. I'll uh, uh, take a motion to adjourn. All right. We're adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>